The Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam by Khadrat Mirza Khulam Ahmad of Qadian, the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. Translated into English by Sir Muhammad Safrullah Khan, former Foreign Minister of Pakistan, President of the UN General Assembly and the International Court of Justice at The Hague. 1996, Islam International Publications Limited. Publisher's Note. The Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam is a well-known essay on Islam by Hadrat Mirza Khulam Ahmad, founder of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. The original was written in order to be read at a conference of great religions held at Lahore on December 26th to 29th of 1896. It has since served as an introduction to Islam for seekers of religious knowledge and truth in different parts of the world. It deals with the following five broad themes set by the moderators of the conference. One, the physical, moral, and spiritual states of man. Two, what is the state of man after death. Three, the object of man's life and the means of its attainment. Four, the operation of the practical ordinances of the law in this life and the next. And five, sources of divine knowledge. It has been published widely in several languages in different countries. The present revised edition was translated by the late Sir Muhammad Zafrullah Khan with meticulous care and faithfulness to the original text which was lacking in previous English translations. Quranic references herein cite chapter and verse. In some renderings, the opening verse, that is, Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, is not counted, and readers using such editions should keep this point in mind to obtain the relevant uh, reference. Introduction A person by the name of Swami Sadhu Shugan Chandra had spent three or four years of his life attempting to reform the Kaasith Hindu caste, In 1892, he came to the conclusion that unless people were gathered together under one roof, his efforts would be in vain. He therefore proposed to convene a religious conference, with the first one taking place in 1892 in Ajmer. In 1896, considering Lahore to be a suitable venue, he began preparations for the second such religious conference. Swami Sahib appointed a committee to oversee the arrangements. Master Durga Parshad was president of the committee and Lala Khanpat Roy, B.A., L.L.B., its chief secretary. The dates chosen for the convention were 26th to 28th of December, 1896, and the following six people were nominated as its moderators. Number one through six, Roy Bahadur Babu Partol Chan Sahib, Ch- judge, chief court, Punjab, Khan Bahadur Sheikh Khuda Bakhsh Sahib, Judge, Small Cause Court, Lahore. Roy Bahadur Pandit Radma Kishan Sahib Kolle, Pleader, Chief Court, Lahore, Former Governor of Jammu. Khadrat Maulvi Hakeem Nur Uddin Sahib, Royal Physician. Roy Pavane Das Sahib, M.A., Extra Settlement Officer, Jailum. Sarda Jawahar Singh Sahib, Secretary Khalsa Committee, Lahore. Footnote. Report, Conference of Great Religions, page 253-54, printed by Siddiqui Press, Lahore, 1897. The committee invited the learned representatives of Muslims, Christians, and Aryas to set forth the excellences of their respective faiths. The objective of the Conference of Great Religions to be held at the Lahore Town Hall was that the excellences and the merits of the true religion be espoused in a gathering of cultured people and that its love be instilled in their hearts and that they become well acquainted with its arguments and proofs. The learned divines of every religion would thus be given the opportunity to convince others of the truth of their respective religions, while the listeners would be able to assess each speech in relation to the others and accept the truth from wherever it was to be found. Disputes between the followers of different religions have given rise to the desire to seek the true faith. 
This is best achieved by bringing together the learned preachers and teachers so that they may, in the context of a few published questions, set forth the beauties of their respective faiths. In such a conference, the true religion from God will definitely become patent. This is the objective of the conference. Every learned teacher and preacher knows that he is duty-bound to make evident the verities of his faith. The conference is being held so that the truth may become manifest, and it is thus a God-given opportunity for them, the learned divines, to fulfill this objective. Such opportunities are not always available to us. Prevailing upon them further, Swami Sahib wrote, If a person sees another suffering from a fatal disease, and he firmly believes that he holds the cure for the disease, and he also claims to have sympathy for the human race, then how is it possible for him to intentionally turn away when called upon to provide a remedy? My heart is filled with a desire to know which religion is the one replete with truth, I have not the words to express my fervor. Representatives of various religions accepted Swami Sahib's invitation, and the Conference of Great Religions was held during the Christmas holidays of 1896. Each of the speakers was required to address five questions published in advance by the committee. The committee also stipulated that, as far as possible, each speaker should confine his answers to the holy book of his religion. The questions were, one through five, the physical, moral, and spiritual states of man, what is the state of man after death, that is, the hereafter, what is the true purpose of man's existence on earth, and how can it be achieved, what are the affects of one's deeds in this life and the afterlife? And what are the sources of divine knowledge? The conference was held on the 26th to 29th of December and was attended by representatives of Sanatan Dharm, Hinduism, Arya Samaj, Freethinker, Brahmo Samaj, Theosophical Society, Religion of Harmony, Christianity, Islam, and Sikhism. All representatives addressed the conference, but only one of the lectures provided a true and complete answer to all five questions. Words cannot describe the atmosphere of the conference when Maulvi Abdul Karim Sialkoti most eloquently delivered the lecture. Every person, regardless of religion, could not help but show his appreciation and approbation. There was not one person who was not engrossed and enraptured. The style of delivery was most interesting and appealing. What better proof of the lecture's excellence than the fact that even the opponents were full of praise for it? Despite being a Christian newspaper, the Civil and Military Gazette, Lahore, considered this speech to be the only one worthy of mention, and it was the only one which it commended highly. The speech was written by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. It could not be completed in the two hours allocated for it, so the conference had to be extended for an extra day. The newspaper Punjab Observer filled column after column with applause for it. Paisa Akbar, Chaudhwin Sadeh, Sadiq ul Akbar, Mukhibir i Dakan, and General Ogohare. Asifi, of Calcutta, etc., all these newspapers were unanimous in their acclaim. Non-Muslims and non-Indians all declared the essay to be the most superior one of the conference. The secretary of the conference, Khtanpat Roy, B.A., L.L.B., Pleader, Chief Court, Punjab, wrote in his report of the Conference of Great Religions, Dharam Mohotsu, these words. There was an interval of half an hour following the speech of Pandit Khordan Das Sahib, as the next item on the agenda was a speech presented on behalf of a renowned advocate of Islam, most people did not leave their place. The large Islamia College building began to fill up long before 1.30 p.m. The gathering numbered between seven and 8,000 people. 
Educated and knowledgeable people from various religions and nations were present, and although plenty of tables, chairs, and floor space had been provided, still hundreds of attendees were left with no choice but to stand. The attendees included many dignitaries, leaders from Punjab, scholars, barristers, lawyers, professors, extra assistants, and doctors. In short, different branches of educated society were all present. They stood for four to five hours, listening with great patience and with rapt attention, and this shows how deeply they cared for this sacred cause. The writer of the paper did not attend in person, but one of his disciples, Maulvi Abdul Karim Sialkoti, was delegated to, to read it at the conference. The committee had allotted two hours for the essay. However, it was not finished in this time. Seeing the avid interest shown by the audience, the moderators willingly agreed to extend the session until the conclusion of the speech. This decision was in exact keeping with the wishes of the participants. Maulvi Abu Yusuf Mubarak Ali agreed to forego his time so that Mirza Sahib's essay could be concluded. This was widely appreciated by the audience and the moderators. The conference had been due to end at 4.30 p.m., but in view of the wishes of the audience, it was extended to beyond 5.30 p.m. The essay was delivered in four hours, and from start to finish, it was most interesting and well appreciated. End of quotation. After receiving prophetic revelation from God on the 21st of December, 1896, a few days before the conference, the founder of the Ahmadiyya movement publicly declared that his essay would be the most overpowering one. A translation of his declaration is presented below. A grand piece of news for seekers after truth. Footnote. In his announcement, Swami Shrugan Chandra Sahib has invited the leading divines of Muslims, Christians, and Aryas in the name of God to set forth the excellences of their respective faiths in the conference proposed by him. We wish to inform Swami Sahib that to do honor to the name of God, as mentioned by him, we are ready to comply with his request, and if God so wills, our paper will be read in the proposed conference. Islam is a faith which directs a true Muslim to demonstrate perfect obedience when he is called upon to do something in the name of God. We shall now see how much regard his brothers, the Aryas and Christian divines, have for the honor of Parmeshwar, or for Jesus, and whether they are ready to participate in the conference which is to be held in the name of the glorious Holy One. Again, a grand piece of news for seekers after truth. In the Conference of Great Religions, which will be held in Lahore Town Hall on the 26th, 7th, and 8th of December, 1896, a paper written by this humble one, dealing with the excellences and miracles of the Holy Koran, will be read out. This paper is not the result of ordinary human effort, but is a sign among the signs of God, written with his special support. It sets forth the beauties and truths of the Holy Koran, and establishes like the noonday sun that the Holy Koran is in truth God's own word, and is a book revealed by the Lord of all creation. Everyone who listens to this paper from the beginning to the end, to my treatment of all the five themes prescribed for the conference, will, I am sure, develop a new faith and will perceive a new light shining within himself and will acquire a comprehensive commentary on the Holy Word of God. This paper of mine is free from human weakness, empty boasts, and vain assertions. I have been moved by sympathy for my fellow human beings to make this announcement so that they should witness the beauty of the Holy Koran and should realize how mistaken are our opponents in that they love darkness and hate light. God, the all-knowing, has revealed to me that my paper will be declared supreme over all other papers. It is full of the light of truth wisdom and understanding which will put to shame all other parties provided they attend the conference and listen to it from beginning to end. They will not be able to match these qualities from their scriptures whether they are Christians or Aryas or those of Sanatan Kharm 
or any others, because God Almighty has determined that the glory of his holy book shall be manifested on that day. I saw in a vision that out of the unseen a hand was laid on my mansion, and by the touch of that hand a shining light emerged from the mansion and spread in all directions. It also illumined my hands. Thereupon someone who was standing by me proclaimed in a loud voice, Allahu Akbar, Kharibat Chaybar. God is great, Chaybar has fallen. The interpretation is that by my mansion is meant my heart on which the heavenly light of the verities of the Holy Quran is descending, and by Chaybar are meant all the perverted religions which are afflicted with paganism and falsehood in which man has been raised to occupy the place of God or in which divine attributes have been cast down from their perfect station. It was thus disclosed to me that the wide publication of this paper would expose the untruth of these false religions and the truth of the Koran will spread progressively around the earth till it arrives at its climax. From this vision my mind moved towards the reception of revelation and I received the revelation God is with you and God stands where you stand. This is a metaphor conveying the assurances of divine support. I need write no more. I urge everyone to attend the conference in Lahore, even at some inconvenience, and listen to these verities. If they do so, their reason and their faith will derive such benefit as is beyond their expectation. Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. Khulam Ahmad Kadian, 21st December, 1896. It would be appropriate here to present as a sample the opinions of a few of the newspapers of the time. Civil and Military Gazette, Lahore. The participants of the conference showed great interest in the lecture of Mirza Khulam Ahmad of Kadian. His paper was an expert and flawless defense of Islam. A great number of people belonging to all sections of society came from far and wide to hear it. Mirza Sahib was unable to attend in person, so his essay was read out by a most able student of his, Maulvi Abdul Karim Sialkoti. On the 27th of December, he spent three hours on the speech, and it was very well received by the attentive audience. However, in the three hours, he was only able to cover one of the five questions. Maulvi Abdul Karim pr promised that if given more time, he would continue with the lecture. The organizers and president therefore decided to extend the conference by an extra day. Gist. Chaudhvin Sade Rawalpindi, 1st of February, 1897. By far the best lecture at the conference was the one written by Mirza Khulam Ahmad and read in a most beautiful manner by the renowned and eloquent speaker Maulvi Abdul Karim Sialkoti. The lecture was delivered in a total of six hours, four hours on the 27th of December and two hours on the 29th, and it filled 100 pages. The audience was captivated, every sentence met with applause, at times, the audience requested that sentences be repeated over and over again. We have never before heard such a pleasing lecture. In truth, the representatives of the other religions did not address the questions posed by the conference. Most speakers dealt largely with the fourth question, only briefly passing over the other ones. A majority of the speakers talked much but said little. The exception was Mirza Sahib's paper, which gave a detailed and comprehensive answer to each of the individual questions. The audience listened with great interest and with undivided attention to a lecture which they found to be most superior and outstanding. We are not followers of Mirza Sahib, nor do we have any kind of contact with him. However, we cannot be unjust in our commentary. In answering the questions, Mirza Sahib relied solely on the Quran. Every major Islamic principle was beautifully expounded using logical and convincing arguments. To first use logical arguments to prove the existence of God and to then quote the word of God is 
style which we find most charming. Not only did Mirza Sahib expound on the philosophy of Quranic teachings, he also explained the philosophy and philology of the Quranic language. In short, Mirza Sahib's lecture was complete and comprehensive, replete with gems of knowledge, wisdom, truths, and mysteries. The philosophy of the divine was so marvelously expressed that the entire audience was left nonplussed. His lecture was the best attended with the hall being packed from top to bottom. The entire audience listened attentively. To illustrate the difference between Mirza Sahib's lecture and those of other speakers, it would suffice to say that people flocked to hear his paper, while, out of boredom, they deserted the others. Maulvi Muhammad Hussain Batalvi's lecture was poor. It was nothing but the usual banal mullahisms. There was nothing exceptional about it. Many people left during Maulvi Mausof's second lecture, and Maulvi Mamduch was not given even a few minutes extra to complete his speech. Gist. General Olgokhar Asifi, Calcutta. 24th January 1897. The following article was published under the dual title of The Conference of Great Religions and The Victory of Islam. Before discussing the conference in general, we would like to point out that, as our readers know, we have in previous editions already argued as to which learned divine presented the most powerful case on behalf of Islam. Keeping a fair and open mind, one of our distinguished correspondents elected Mirza Hulam Ahmad of Qadian as the champion of Islam, and another correspondent, in a letter to us, has expressed the same opinion. Maulvi Fakhruddin Sahib Fakhr strongly argues that Mirza Hulam Hamad of Qadian heads the list, followed by Sir Syed Ahmad Sahib of Aligarh. The other names he suggested as possible champions of Islam were Maulvi Abu Sa'ed Muhammad Hussain Sahib Batalvi, Haji Syed Muhammad Ali Sahib Kanpuri, and Maulvi Ahmad Hussain Sahib Azemabadi. It would not be out of place to mention here that one of our correspondents also suggested the name of Maulvi Abdul Haq Sahib Delkhvi, author of Tafsair i Hakhani. Gist. After publishing an excerpt from Swami Shugan Chandra's invitation to the conference, the newspaper went on to say, Having read the pamphlets publicizing the conference, which of the scholars' sense of pride was awoken to champion the holy religion of Islam, how far did they take up the cause and impress upon others by way of logical reasoning the majesty of the divine? We have learnt from reliable sources that the organizers of the conference wrote letters of invitation to Mirza Khulam Ahmad Sahib and Sir Syed Ahmad Sahib. Poor health prevented Khadrat Mirza Sahib from attending in person, but he delegated one of his top disciples, Maulvi Abdul Karim Sialkoti, to read his paper at the conference. However, Sir Syed did not attend, nor did he submit a paper, and it was not a old age or other commitments which prevented him from doing so. In fact, he considered a religious conference to be unworthy of his attention. In responding to the invitation, we will publish his response in one of our future editions, he wrote, I am not a preacher or a reformer or a maulvi. This conference is for preachers and reformers. Maulvi Syed Muhammad Ali Sahib Kanpuri, Maulvi Abdul Haq Sahib Delhvi, and Maulvi Ahmad Hussain Sahib Azembadi did not show much interest in the conference, and not one of the multitude of other learned religious scholars of our country bothered to prepare any paper for presentation there. Admittedly, one or two people did take up the challenge, only to see their efforts rebound on themselves. As our next report will prove, they either said nothing relevant or they just made a few empty remarks. The proceedings of the conference show that it was only Khadrat Mirza Khulam Hamad of Qadian who truly championed the cause of Islam and that he honored the trust people had put in himself for the representation of Islam. His representation was approved by many sects of Islam from Peshawar, Rawalpindi, Shailum, Shapur, 
Bera, Chosab, Sialkot, Jamun, Vazairabad, Lahore, Amritsar, Gurdaspur, Luthiana, Shimla, Delhi, Ambala, Riasat Patiala, Deradon, Ilahabad, Madras, Bombay, Hyderabad, Dakhan, Bangalore, etc., of India. It is true to say that if Mirza Sahib's paper had not been presented, the Muslims would have been disgraced in comparison to other religions. Had it not been for the powerful hand of the Almighty, the religion of Islam would not have prevailed. It was because of Mirza Sahib's essay that Islam's glory was established. Friends and opponents alike admitted the superiority of the paper over others. In fact, once it was over, even the enemies of Islam were forced to admit that the speech had helped them to understand the teachings of Islam and that Islam had been victorious. Mirza Sahib's selection as champion of Islam is most appropriate. No one can object to his selection. He has given us reason to feel proud, and in this is Islam's glory and greatness. This was only the second conference of great religions, but the size of the gathering and its high intellectual content far surpassed all other congresses and conferences. Great leaders from all the major cities of India were present, and we take pride in saying that the city of Madras was also represented. The conference proved to be so interesting that instead of the advertised three days, the organizers had to extend it to four days. The organizers had selected Islamia College as the venue, as it was the largest public place in Lahore. But so many people participated that even this huge place proved inadequate. The great success of the conference can be seen from the fact that not only did the leading citizens of the Punjab attend, but the judges of the chief court and high court of Allahabad, the Honorable Babu Partol Chand Sahib and Mr. Banerjee, were also present. End of the gist of newspaper reports. Hadrat Mirza Khulam Hamad Sahib's paper was published in the Report of the Conference of Great Religions, Lahore, and the Ahmadiyya Muslim community had published it in book form under the title Islami Usul Ki Philosophy. It has been translated into English under the title of The Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam. Many editions of the book have been printed and it has been translated into French, Dutch, Spanish, Arabic, German, and various other languages. Many philosophers and foreign newspapers have given it favorable reviews and many Western intellectuals have praised it highly. For example, one through five. The Bristol Times and Mirror wrote, Surely the man who addresses Europe and America in this manner can be no ordinary being. Gist. These are all gists. Number two. Spiritual Journal, Boston, wrote, This book is good news for the whole human race. Three. Theosophical Book Notes wrote, this book is a most beautiful and endearing picture of Muhammad's religion. Number four, Indian Review wrote, This book presents clear thinking and perfect wisdom, and the reader is left with no choice but to praise it. And five, Muslim Review wrote, Anyone reading this book is bound to find a great many truths most deep and pleasing to the soul. The beauty of the paper is that it does not attack any religion. It only explains the beauty and the merits of Islam. All the questions are answered with reference to the Holy Quran in a manner which proves the perfection of Islam and its superiority over all other religions. Jalal Uddin Shams A Grand Piece of News for Seekers After Truth in his announcement, Swami Shugan Chandra Sahib has invited the leading divines of Muslims, Christians, and Aryas in the name of God that they should set forth the excellences of their respective faiths in the conference proposed by him. We wish to inform Swami Sahib that to do honor to the name of God as mentioned by him, we are ready to comply with his request and, if God so wills, our paper will be read in the proposed conference. 
Islam is a faith which directs a true Muslim to demonstrate perfect obedience when he is called upon to do something in the name of God. We shall now see how much regard his brothers, the Aryas and the Christian divines, have for the honor of Permeshwar, or for Jesus, and whether they are ready to participate in the conference which is to be held in the name of the Glorious Holy One. In the Conference of Great Religions, which will be held in Lahore Town Hall on the 26th, 7th, and 8th of December, 1896, a paper written by this humble one dealing with the excellences and miracles of the Holy Koran will be read out. This paper is not the result of ordinary human effort, but is a sign among the signs of God written with his special support. It sets forth the beauties and truths of the Holy Koran and establishes, like the noonday sun, that the Holy Koran is in truth God's own word and is a book revealed by the Lord of all creation. Everyone who listens to this paper from beginning to the end to my treatment of all the five themes prescribed for the conference will, I am sure, develop a new faith and will perceive a new light shining within himself and will acquire a comprehensive commentary on the Holy Word of God. This paper of mine is free from human weaknesses, empty boasts, and vain assertions. I have been moved by sympathy for my fellow beings to make this announcement so that they should witness the beauty of the Holy Koran and should realize how mistaken are our opponents in that they love darkness and hate light. God, the all-knowing, has revealed to me that my paper will be declared supreme over all other papers. It is full of the light of truth, wisdom, and understanding which will put to shame all other parties provided they attend the conference and listen to it from beginning to end. They will not be able to match these qualities from their scriptures, whether they are Christians or Aryas or those of Sanatan Dharm or any others, because God Almighty has determined that the glory of his holy book shall be manifested on that day. I saw in a vision that out of the unseen a hand was laid on my mansion, and by the touch of that hand a shining light emerged from the mansion and spread itself in all directions. It also illumined my hands. Thereupon, someone who was standing by me proclaimed in a loud voice, Allahu Akbar, Kharibat Khaybar, God is great, Khaybar has fallen. The interpretation is that by my mansion is meant my heart, on which the heavenly light of the verities of the Holy Quran is descending. And by Khaybar are meant all the perverted religions which are afflicted with paganism and falsehood, in which man has been raised to occupy the place of God, or in which divine attributes have been cast down from their perfect station. It was thus disclosed to me that the wide publication of this paper would expose the untruth of false religions, and the truth of the Koran will spread progressively around the earth till it arrives at its climax. From this vision, my mind moved towards the reception of revelation, and I received the revelation, Arabic, God is with you, and God stands where you stand. This is a metaphor conveying the assurance of divine support. I need write no more. I urge everyone to attend the conference in Lahore, even at some inconvenience, and to listen to these verities. If they do so, their reason and their faith will derive such benefit as is beyond their expectation. Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. Ghulam Ahmad, Qadian, 21st December, 1896. In the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful, we praise him and call down his blessings on his noble messenger. Islam It is necessary that a claim and the reasons in support of it must be set forth from a revealed book. In this auspicious conference, the purpose of which is that those who have been invited to participate in it should expound the merits of their respective religions with reference to the questions that have been formulated, I shall today set forth the merits of Islam. Before I proceed to do so, I deem it proper to announce that I have made it obligatory upon myself that whatever I state will be based upon the Holy Koran, which is the word of God Almighty. 
I consider it essential that everyone who follows a book, believing it to be revealed, should base his exposition upon that book, and should not so extend the scope of his advocacy of his faith as if he is compiling a new book. As it is my purpose today to establish the merits of the Holy Koran and to demonstrate its excellence, it is incumbent upon me not to state anything which is not comprehended in the Koran, and to set forth everything on the basis of its verses and in accord with their meaning and that which might be inferred from them, so that those attending the conference should encounter no difficulty in carrying out a comparison between the teachings of different religions. As all those who believe in a revealed book will also confine themselves to statements comprised in their respective revealed books, I shall not make any reference to the traditions of the Holy Prophet, inasmuch as all true traditions are only derived from the Holy Koran, which is a perfect book comprehending all other books. In short, this is the day of the manifestation of the glory of the Holy Koran, and I humbly beseech God Almighty to assist me in this undertaking. Amen. First question. The physical, moral, and spiritual states of man. In the first few pages of this paper, I have set forth certain introductory matters which might at first sight seem irrelevant, and yet it is necessary to have a clear concept of those matters for the proper appreciation of the reply to the question that has been set out above. Three Types of Human Actions The first question relates to the natural and moral and spiritual states of man. The Holy Koran has indicated three separate sources of these three states. In other words, it has pointed out three springs out of which these respective states flow. First source, the self that incites to evil. The first spring, which is the source of all natural states, is designated by the Holy Koran, the nafse amarach, which means the self that incites to evil. As it says, <laughs> This means that it is characteristic of the human self that it incites man to evil and is opposed to his attainment of perfection and to his moral state and urges him toward undesirable and evil ways. Thus the propensity towards evil and intemperance is a human state which predominates over the mind of a person before he enters upon the moral state. This is man's natural state, so long as he is not guided by reason and understanding, but follows his natural bent in eating, drinking, sleeping, waking, anger, and provocation like the animals. When a person is guided by reason and understanding and brings his natural state under control and regulates it in a proper manner, then these three states, as described, cease to remain the categories as natural states, but are called moral states. Second source, the reproving self. The source of the moral state of man is designated by the Holy Koran Nafse Lawama, as is said, I call to witness the reproving self, chapter 75, verse 3, that is to say, I call to witness the self that reproves itself for every vice and intemperance. This reproving self is the second source of human state from which the moral state is generated. At this stage, man ceases to resemble the animals. Calling it to witness is for the purpose of doing it honor, as if by advancing from the state of the self that is prone to evil and arriving at the state of the reproving self, it has become worthy of honor in divine estimation. It is so called as it reproves man on vice and is not reconciled to man's submitting to his natural desires and leading an unbridled existence like the animals. It desires that man should be in a good state and should practice good morals and no kind of intemperance should be manifested in any aspect of human life 
and natural emotions and desires should be regulated by reason. As it reproves every vicious movement, it is called the reproving self. Though it reproves itself in respect of vices, yet it is not fully effective in practicing virtue, and occasionally it is dominated by natural emotions when it stumbles and falls. It is like a weak child who does not wish to stumble and fall, but does so out of weakness and is then remorseful over his infirmity. In short, this is the moral state of human self when it seeks to comprehend within itself high moral qualities and is disgusted with disobedience but cannot achieve complete success. The third source, the soul at rest. The third source which should be described as the beginning of the spiritual state of man is called by the Holy Koran Nafse Mutmainach, which is to say the soul at rest, as is said. <laughs> O soul at rest that has found comfort in God, return to thy Lord, thou well pleased with him, and he well pleased with thee. Now join my chosen servants, and enter into my garden. Chapter 89, verses 28 to 31. This is the stage when the soul of a person being delivered from all weaknesses is filled with spiritual powers and establishes a relationship with God Almighty without whose support it cannot exist. As water flowing down from a height, on account of its volume and the absence of any obstruction, rushes with great force, in the same way the soul at rest flows towards God. That is indicated by the divine direction to the soul that has found comfort in God to return to its Lord. It undergoes a great transformation in this very life and is bestowed a paradise while still in this world. As this verse indicates in its direction to such a soul to return to its Lord, it is nourished by its Lord and its love of God becomes its nurture and it drinks at this fountain of life and is thus delivered from death. This is indicated at another place in the Holy Quran where it is said <laughs> He who purifies his soul of earthly passions shall be saved and shall not suffer ruin but he who is overcome by his earthly passions should despair of life. Chapter 91, verses 10 and 11. In short, these three states may be called the natural, moral, and spiritual states of man. As the natural urges of man become very dangerous when they are roused and often destroy the moral and spiritual qualities, they are described in God's holy book as the self that incites to evil. It may be asked what is the attitude of the Holy Koran towards the natural state of man, what guidance does it furnish concerning it, and how does it seek to control it? The answer is that according to the Holy Koran, the natural state of man has a very strong relationship with his moral and spiritual states, so much so that even a person's manner of eating and drinking affects his moral and spiritual states. If the natural state of a person is subjected to the control of the directions of divine law, it becomes his moral state and deeply affects his spirituality, as is said that whatever falls into a salt mine is converted into salt. That is why the Holy Koran has laid stress on physical cleanliness and postures and their regulation in relation to all worship and inner purity and spiritual humility. Reflection confirms that physical conditions deeply affect the soul, for instance, when our eyes are filled with tears, even if the tears are artificially induced, the heart is immediately affected and becomes sorrowful. In the same way, when we begin to laugh, even if the laughter is artificially induced, the heart begins to feel cheerful. 
It has also been observed that physical prostration in prayer induces humility in the soul. As a contrast, when we draw ourselves up physically and strut about with our neck raised and our breast pushed forward, this attitude induces a mood of arrogance and vainglory. These instances establish clearly that physical conditions certainly affect spiritual conditions. Experience also shows that different types of food affect the intellect and the mind in different ways. For instance, careful observation would disclose that people who refrain altogether from eating meat gradually suffer a decline of the faculty of bravery. They lose courage and thus suffer the loss of a divinely bestowed praiseworthy faculty. This is reinforced by the evidence of the divine law of nature that the herbivorous animals do not possess the same degree of courage as do carnivorous ones. The same applies to birds. Thus there is no doubt that morals are affected by food. Conversely, those who are given to a diet consisting mainly of meat and eat very little of greens suffer a decline of meekness and humility. Those who adopt the middle course develop both types of moral qualities. That is why God Almighty has said in the Holy Quran, Eat and drink, but do not be immoderate. Chapter 7, verse 32. That is to say, eat meat and other foods, but do not eat anything to excess, lest your moral state be adversely affected and your health might suffer. As the soul is affected by physical conduct, in the same way sometimes the soul affects the body. For instance, when a person experiences sorrow, his eyes become wet and a person who feels happy smiles. All our natural actions like eating, drinking, sleeping, waking, moving about, resting, bathing, etc. affect our spiritual condition. Our physical structure is related intimately to our total humanity. If a certain part of the brain is injured, memory is immediately lost. An injury to another part of the brain causes loss of consciousness. Poisonous air affects the body and through it the mind and the whole inner system to which the moral impulses are related is impaired and the unfortunate victim passes out quickly like a madman. Thus physical injuries disclose that there is a mysterious relationship between the soul and the body which is beyond the ken of man. Reflection shows that the body is the mother of the soul. The soul does not descend from outside into the womb of a pregnant woman. It is a light that is inherent in the sperm which begins to shine forth with the development of the fetus. The word of God Almighty conveys to us that the soul becomes manifest from the framework that is prepared in the womb from the sperm, as is said in the Holy Koran. <laughs> Then we develop it into a new creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. Chapter 23, verse 15. This means that God bestows a new creation on the body that is prepared in the womb, and that new creation is called the soul. Greatly blessed is God who has no equal as a creator. The affirmation that a new creation is manifested from the body is a mystery that reveals the reality of the soul and points to the strong relationship between the soul and the body. We are also instructed thereby that the same philosophy underlies the physical acts and words and movements when they are manifested in the cause of God. That is to say, all these sincere actions are charged with a soul as the sperm is charged with a soul. As the framework of these actions is developed, the soul with which they are charged begins to shine, and when that framework becomes complete, the soul inside it shines forth in its full manifestation and discloses its spiritual aspect. At that stage, those actions become fully alive. This means that when the framework of actions is completed, something shines forth from it suddenly, like a flash of lightning. 
This is the stage concerning which God Almighty says in the Holy Quran. <laughs> When I have completed his framework and have set right all his manifestations of glory and have breathed into him my spirit, then fall down in prostration, all of you, on his account. Chapter 15, verse 30. This verse indicates that when the framework of actions is completed, a soul shines forth in it, which God attributes to himself inasmuch as that framework is completed at the cost of worldly life. Thus the divine light, which is dim in the beginning, suddenly shines forth, so that on the beholding of this divine manifestation it becomes incumbent on everyone to fall into prostration and to be drawn to that light. Everyone perceiving that light falls into prostration and is naturally drawn to it, except Iblis, who loves darkness. The soul is created. It is absolutely true that the soul is a fine light developed inside the body and which is nurtured in the womb. To begin with, it is hidden and imperceptible, and later it is made manifest. From the very beginning, its essence is present in the sperm. It is related to the sperm in a mysterious manner by the design and command and will of God. It is a bright, and illumined quality of the sperm. It cannot be said that it is a part of the sperm as matter is part of matter, nor can it be said that it comes from outside or falls upon the earth and gets mixed with the matter of the sperm. It is latent in the sperm as fire is latent in the flint. The book of God does not mean that the soul descends from heaven as a separate entity or falls upon the earth from the atmosphere and then by chance gets mixed with the sperm and enters the womb with it, there is no basis for such a notion. The law of nature rejects it. We observe daily that thousands of insects infect impure and stale foods and are generated in unwashed wounds. Dirty linen secretes hundreds of lice and all sorts of worms are generated inside a person's stomach. It cannot be said that all these come from outside or can be observed as descending from heaven. The truth is that the soul is developed in the body, and this also proves that it is created and is not self-existent. The Second Birth of the Soul The design of the Almighty who has created the soul from the body with his perfect power, appears to be that the second birth of the soul should also take place through the body. The movements of the soul follow the movements of the body. If the body is drawn in a particular direction, the soul automatically follows it. It is therefore a function of the book of God to direct itself to the natural state of man. That is why the Holy Koran pays so much attention to the reform of the natural state of man and gives directions with regard to every one of his actions, his laughing, weeping, eating, clothing, sleeping, speaking, keeping silent, marrying, remaining celibate, walking, standing still, outward cleanliness, bathing, submitting to a discipline in health and in illness, etc. It affirms that man's physical condition affects his spiritual condition deeply. I cannot undertake a detailed exposition of all these directions, as time is not available for such an undertaking. Gradual Progress of Man Reflection on the Holy Word of God discloses that it lays down rules for the reform of the natural condition of man and then lifts him gradually upwards and desires to raise him to the highest spiritual state. First, God desires to teach man the rules of social behavior like sitting, standing, eating, drinking, talking, etc., and thus to deliver him from a state of barbarism and distinguish him from the animals and thus bestow upon him an elementary moral state which might be described as social culture. He then desires to regulate his elementary moral habits so that they should acquire the character of high moral qualities. 
Both these methods are part of the same process as they are related to the reform of man's natural condition. There is between them a difference only of degree. The all-wise one has so arranged the moral system that man should be able to rise from a low to a high moral condition. The third grade of progress is that a person should become wholly devoted to the love of his true creator and to a winning of his pleasure. The whole of his being should be committed to God. To remind Muslims constantly of this grade, their religion has been named Islam, which means to devote oneself wholly to God and to keep nothing back. As God the Glorious has said, Salvation means that a person should commit himself wholly to God and should offer himself as a sacrifice in the cause of God and should prove his sincerity not only through his motive but also through righteous conduct. He who so comports himself will have his recompense from God. Such people shall have no fear nor shall they grieve. Chapter 2 verse 113 Tell them... My prayer and my sacrifices, my living and my dying, are all for the sake of God, whose providence comprehends everything and who has no associate. So have I been commanded, and I am the foremost of those who fulfill this concept of Islam and offer themselves as a sacrifice in the cause of Allah. Chapter 6, verses 163 and 64. This is my straight path, then follow it, and do not follow any other path which will lead you away from his path. Chapter 6, verse 154. Tell them, if you love God, then follow me and walk along my path, so that God may love you and forgive you your sins. He is most forgiving, ever merciful. Chapter 3, verse 32. Distinction between the natural and moral states and a refutation of the doctrine of preservation of life. I shall now proceed to describe the three states of man, but before I do so, it is necessary for me to voice a reminder that, as indicated in the holy work of God Almighty, the natural state of man, the fountainhead of which is the self that incites to evil, is not something divorced from his moral state. The Holy Word of God has classified man's natural faculties and desires and urges as natural conditions. These, when they are consciously regulated and controlled and are brought into action on their proper occasions and places, become moral qualities. In the same way, moral conditions are not entirely distinct from spiritual conditions. When moral conditions develop absolute devotion to God and complete purification of self and cutting asunder from the world, turn wholly to God and to perfect love and complete devotion and full serenity and satisfaction and complete accord with the divine will, they become spiritual conditions. 
So long as his natural conditions are not converted into moral conditions, man deserves no praise, inasmuch as they are to be found in other animates and even in solids also. In the same way, the mere acquisition of moral qualities does not bestow spiritual life upon a person. A person who denies the existence of God can yet exhibit good moral qualities, such as to be humble of heart, to seek peace, to discard evil, and not to resist the evil monger. These are all natural conditions which may be possessed even by an unworthy one who is utterly unacquainted with the fountainhead of salvation and enjoys no part of it. Many animals have a gentle disposition and can be trained to become wholly peaceful and not to react savagely to chastisement, and yet we cannot call them human, let alone humans of high status. In the same way, a person who is entirely misguided and even suffers from some vices can exhibit these qualities. It is possible that a person may develop mercy to a degree in which he would not permit himself to kill the germs that might be generated in his wounds, or might be so mindful of preserving life that he may not wish to harm the lice in his hair or the insects that are generated in his stomach and his arteries and his brain. I can believe that a person's mercy might impel him to discard the use of honey as it is procured by the destruction of many lives and by driving the poor bees out of their hives. I can believe that a person may avoid the use of musk as it is the blood of a poor animal and is procured by slaughtering it and separating it from its young. I do not deny that a person might refrain from wearing pearls or silk as both these are procured through the death of worms. I can even understand that a person in pain might refuse to be bled by leeches and might prefer to suffer pain himself rather than desire the death of poor leeches. I can even believe that a person might carry his mercy and regard for life to a degree that he might refuse to drink water in order to spare the germs in the water. I can accept all this, but, but I cannot accept that these natural conditions can be regarded as moral qualities, or that they can serve to wash out the inner impurities which obstruct a person's approach to God. I cannot believe that to become harmless to a degree in which some animals and birds excel man can become the means of the acquisition of a high degree of humanity. Indeed, I consider this attitude as amounting to opposition to the law of nature and inconsistent with the high moral quality of seeking the pleasure of God. It rejects the bounties that nature has bestowed upon us. Spirituality can be achieved only through the use of every moral quality in its proper place and on its proper occasion, and through treading faithfully upon the ways of God and through being wholly devoted to Him. He who becomes truly God's cannot exist without him. A true seeker after God is like a fish sacrificed by the hand of God, and its water is the love of God. Three Methods of Reform The Advent of the Holy Prophet at the Time of the Greatest Need As I have stated, there are three springs from which human states flow, namely, the self that incites to evil, the self that reproves, and the soul at rest. There are also three methods of reform. The first is that senseless savages should be taught the elementary social values pertaining to eating, drinking, marriage, etc. They should not go about naked, nor eat carrion like dogs, nor practice any other type of wildness. This is an elementary stage of the reform of natural conditions of the type that would have to be adopted, for instance, if it is desired to teach a savage from Port Blair the elementary ways of human behavior. The second method of reform is that when a person has adopted elementary human ways, he may be taught the higher moral qualities and should be instructed to employ his faculties in their proper places and on their proper occasions. The third method of reform is that those who have acquired high moral qualities should be given a taste of the draught of the love of and union with God. Our Lord and Master, the Holy Prophet,
peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was raised at a time when the world had been thoroughly corrupted. As God Almighty has said, Zahar al fil wal Corruption has spread over land and sea, chapter 30, verse 42. This means that the people of the book, as well as those who had no experience of revelation, had all been corrupted. The purpose of the Holy Koran was to revive the dead, as is said, Know that Allah is about to revive the earth after its death. Chapter 57, verse 18. At that time, the people of Arabia were steeped in barbarism. No social pattern prevailed, and they took pride in every type of sin and misconduct. A man married an unlimited number of wives, and they were all addicted to the use of everything unlawful. They considered it lawful to marry their mothers, and that is why God Almighty had to prescribe Your mothers are made unlawful for you. Chapter 4, verse 24. They ate carrion, and some of them were even cannibals. There is not a sin of which they were not guilty. Most of them did not believe in the afterlife. Many of them denied the existence of God. They killed their female infants with their own hands. They killed orphans and devoured their substance. They had the appearance of human beings, but were bereft of reason. They possessed no modesty, no shame, and no self-respect. They drank liquor like water. The one among them who indulged indiscriminately in fornication was acknowledged as the chief of his tribe. They were so utterly ignorant that their neighboring people called them the unlettered ones. At such time, and for the reform of such people, our Lord and Master, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, appeared in Mecca. This was the time that called for the three types of reform that we have just mentioned. That is why the Holy Koran claims to be more complete and more perfect than all other books of guidance, inasmuch as the other books had not the opportunity of carrying out the three types of reforms which the Holy Koran was designed to carry out. The purpose of the Holy Koran was to elevate savages into men and then to equip them with moral qualities and finally raise them to the level of godly persons the Holy Koran thus comprehends all those three projects. The true purpose of the teachings of the Holy Koran is the reform of the three conditions. Natural conditions by regulation become moral qualities. Before I embark upon a detailed exposition of the threefold reforms that I have just mentioned, it is necessary to point out that there is no teaching in the Holy Koran which is imposed by compulsion. The whole purpose of the Koran is the three reforms, and all its teachings are directed towards that end. All other directions are the means for the achievement of those reforms. As sometimes a surgeon has to perform an operation in order to restore the patient to normal health, or has to apply an ointment, in the same way the teachings of the Koran, out of sympathy for mankind, have recourse to such means also. The purpose of all Koranic insights and admonitions and directions is to raise man from his natural condition of barbarity to a moral state, and then to lift him from that state to the limitless ocean of spirituality. We have already stated that natural conditions are not something distinct from moral conditions. When they are regulated and are used on their proper occasions, under the direction of reason, they acquire a moral character. Before they are controlled by reason and understanding, they have not the character of moral qualities, but are natural impulses, however much they might resemble moral qualities. For instance, if a dog or lamb displays affection or docility toward its master, it would not be described as moral or good-mannered. In the same way, a wolf or a tiger would not be described as ill-mannered on account of its wildness. 
A moral state emerges after reflection and regard for time and occasion come into play. A person who does not exercise reason and deliberation is like a child whose mind and intellect are not yet governed by reason, or is like a madman who has lost his reason and good sense. A child or a madman sometimes believes in a manner that has the appearance of moral action, but no sensible person calls such conduct moral, as such conduct does not proceed from good sense and appropriateness, but is a natural reaction to the circumstances. A human infant, as soon as it is born, seeks its mother's breasts, and a chicken, as soon as it is hatched, begins to pick up corn. In the same way, the spawn of a leech behaves like a leech, a baby serpent behaves like a serpent, and a tiger cub behaves like a tiger. A human infant begins to exhibit human reactions as soon as it is born, and those reactions become more and more remarkable as it begins to grow up. For instance, its weeping becomes louder, and its smiles become laughter, and its gaze becomes more concentrated. At the age of a year or eighteen months, it develops another natural trait. It begins to display its pleasure and displeasure through its movements and tries to strike someone or to give something to someone. All these motions are natural impulses. Similarly, a barbarian who possesses little human sense is like such an infant and displays natural impulses in his words, actions, and movements and is governed by his natural emotions. Nothing proceeds from him in consequence of the exercise of his inner faculties. Whatever surges up from his inside under the operation of a natural impulse and as a reaction to external stimuli becomes manifest. It is possible that his natural impulses that are exhibited as a reaction to any external stimulus may not all be vicious, and some might resemble good morals, but they are not normally the consequences of reasonable reflection and consideration, and even if they are to some degree so motivated, they cannot be relied upon on account of the domination of natural impulses. In short, we cannot attribute true morals to a person who is subject to natural impulses like animals or infants or the insane and who lives more or less like animals. The time of true morals, whether good or bad, begins with a person's reason becoming mature and he is able to distinguish between good and bad and the degree of evil and goodness and begins to feel sorry when he misses an opportunity of doing good and is remorseful when he has done some wrong. This is the second stage of his life which is designated by the Holy Koran, the self that reproves. It should, however, be remembered that casual admonition is not enough to lead a barbarian to the stage of the self that reproves. It is necessary that he should become conscious of the existence of God to a degree at which he should not consider his creation as without purpose so that an understanding of the divine should stimulate his true moral qualities. That is why God Almighty has drawn attention to the need of understanding of the divine and has assured man that every act and moral produces an effect which brings about spiritual comfort or spiritual pain in this life and will be manifested clearly in the hereafter. In short, at the stage of the self that reproves, a person is bestowed so much of reason and understanding and good conscience that he reproves himself over a wrong done by him and is anxious to do good. That is the stage when a person acquires high moral qualities. Distinction between chalk, creation, and chulk, morals. Chalk connotes physical birth, and chulk connotes inner birth. As inner birth is perfected through moral development and not merely through the exercise of natural impulses, chulk connotes moral qualities and not natural impulses. It should be pointed out that the common conception that morals merely mean meekness, courtesy, and humility is entirely mistaken. The truth is that corresponding to every physical action, there is an inner quality which is moral. For instance, a person sheds tears through the eyes 
And corresponding to that action, there is an inner quality which is called tenderness, which takes on the character of a moral quality when, under the control of reason, it is exercised on its proper occasion. In the same way, a person defends himself against the attack of an enemy with his hands, and corresponding to this action, there is an inner quality which is called bravery. When this quality is exercised at its proper place and on its proper occasion, it is called a moral quality. Similarly, a person sometimes seeks to relieve the oppressed from the oppression of tyrants, or desires to make provision for the indigent and the hungry, or wishes to serve his fellow beings in some other way, and corresponding to such action there is an inner quality which is designated mercy. Sometimes a person punishes a wrongdoer, and corresponding to such action there is an inner quality which is called retribution. Sometimes a person does not wish to attack one who attacks him, and forbears to take action against a wrongdoer, corresponding to which there is a quality which is called forbearance or endurance. Sometimes a person works with his hands or feet, or employs his mind and intellect, or his wealth, in order to promote the welfare of his fellow beings, corresponding to which there is an inner quality, which is called benevolence. Thus, when a person exercises all these qualities on their proper occasions and at their proper places, they are called moral qualities. God, the glorious, has addressed the holy prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, in the words, <laughs> Thou dost most surely possess high moral excellences. Chapter 68, verse 5. This means that all high moral qualities such as benevolence, courage, justice, mercy, bountifulness, sincerity, high-mindedness, etc., were combined in the person of the Holy Prophet. In short, all the natural qualities of man as courtesy, modesty, Integrity, benevolence, jealousy, steadfastness, chastity, piety, equity, sympathy, bravery, generosity, forbearance, endurance, bountifulness, sincerity, loyalty, etc., when they are manifested on their proper occasions under the guidance of reason and reflection, would all be accounted moral qualities. In reality, they are the natural states and impulses of man and are designated moral qualities when they are exercised deliberately on their proper occasions. A natural characteristic of man is that he desires to make progress and therefore, through following a true religion and keeping good company and conforming to good teachings, he converts his natural impulses into moral qualities. No other animal is invested with this characteristic. Natural States of Man We shall now proceed to set forth the first of the three reforms which is inculcated by the Holy Koran and which is related to the natural state of man. This reform relates to what are known as good manners, that is to say the code that regulates the natural conditions of barbarians like eating, drinking, marriage, etc., and establishes them at a just level of social values and rescues them from an animal existence. In this context, the Holy Koran ordains, وَأُمَّهَاتُكُمْ <laughs> وَحَلَائِلُ أَبْنَائِكُمُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ أَصْلَابِكُمْ 
وال محروم ہزاریات بیس وَإِن خِفْتُمْ مَلَّا تُقْسِسُوا فِي الْيَتَامَا فَانْجِحُوا مَا تُعَبَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَائِ مَثْنَا وَسُلَاسَ وَرُبَا فَإِن خِفْتُمْ مَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدَةً النساء چار Forbidden to you are your mothers and your daughters and your sisters and your father's sisters and your mother's sisters and the daughters of your brothers and the daughters of your sisters and your foster mothers and your foster sisters and the mothers of your wives and your stepdaughters by your wives with whom you have consorted but if you have consorted not with them it shall be no sin upon you and the wives of your sons from your loins you are also forbidden to join two sisters together in marriage but what has passed has passed surely Allah is most forgiving, ever merciful. Chapter 4, verse 24. It is not lawful for you to inherit from women against their will. Chapter 4, verse 20. It is not lawful for you to marry women whom your fathers had married, except that which happened in the past. Chapter 4, verse 23. Lawful for you are chaste believing women and chaste women from among those who were given the book before you when you give them their dowers, contracting valid marriages, not committing fornication, nor taking secret paramours. Chapter 5, verse 6. In the time of ignorance, some of the Arabs who were childless permitted their wives to consort with someone else for the purpose of having a child. The Holy Koran forbade this practice. The expression, taking secret paramours, has reference to this practice. Then it is said, Destroy not yourselves, chapter 4, verse 30, and slay not your progeny, chapter 6, verse 152. Do not enter houses other than your own, freely like barbarians, until you have obtained leave. And when you have obtained leave and enter, greet the inmates with the salutation of peace. If you find no one therein, then enter not until leave is given to you. If you are told by the inmates to go back, then go back. Chapter 24, verses 28 and 29. Do not enter houses by scaling over their walls. Enter them through the doors. Chapter 2, verse 190. When you are greeted with a salutation, greet with a better salutation. Chapter 4, verse 87. Liquor, gambling, idols, and divining arrows are but abominations and satanic devices, so turn wholly away from each of them. Chapter 5, verse 91. Forbidden to you is the flesh of a dead animal, and blood, and the flesh of swine, and that on which the name of someone other than Allah has been invoked, and the flesh of an animal that has been strangled, or is beaten to death, or is killed by a fall, or is gored to death, and of which a wild animal has eaten, and that which has been slaughtered at an altar, for they are all carrion. Chapter 5, verse 4. If they ask thee what is lawful for them, tell them all good things are lawful for you. Chapter 5, verse 5. Refrain from that which is carrion or resembles carrion or is unclean. When you are asked to make room for others in your assemblies, then hasten to make room so that others might be seated. And when you are asked to rise up, then rise up without delay. Chapter 58, verse 12. Eat of all that is lawful and wholesome, like meat, vegetables, and pulses, etc., but do not be immoderate in any respect. Chapter 7, verse 32. Do not talk at random and talk to the point. Chapter 33, verse 71. Keep your raiment clean and your bodies and your streets and the places where you sit. Take frequent baths and cultivate the habit of keeping your homes neat and tidy. Chapter 75, verses 5 and 6. Moderate your voice, and speak not with a loud voice, nor whisper, and except when needed otherwise, walk at a moderate pace, neither too fast nor too slow. 
chapter 31, verse 20. When you go on a journey, make all preparation and take necessary provisions so as to avoid having to beg. Chapter 2, verse 198. When you consort with your spouses, purify yourselves by bathing. Chapter 5, verse 7. When you eat, give out of your food to him who asks and also to dogs and other animals and birds. Chapter 51, verse 20. There is no harm in your marrying orphan girls who are under your care, but if you apprehend that you may not be fair in dealing with them because they are orphans, then marry women who have parents and relations to be watchful of them, who would respect you and concerning whom you would be careful. You may marry two or three or four of them, provided you can deal equitably with all of them. But if you feel that you may not deal justly between them, then marry only one, even if you should feel the need of more than one. The limit of four is imposed, lest you should be inclined towards marrying a larger number, amounting to hundreds, according to your old custom, and so that you should not incline toward illicit indulgence. Hand over to your wives their dowers freely. Chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. This is the first reform of the Holy Koran whereby man is raised from his natural state and barbaric ways to the status of a civilized social being. In these teachings there is no mention of the higher moral qualities. They are concerned only with elementary human behavior. This teaching was needed because the people for whose reform the Holy Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was sent, were in an extreme state of barbarity, and it was necessary that they should be taught the elementary rules of social behavior. Why is the flesh of swine prohibited? One matter to be kept in mind in this context is that in the very name of this animal, God has indicated the reason for the prohibition of its flesh. The Arabic word for swine is khinzair, which is a compound of khans and ara, which means I see it very foul. Thus the name that God Almighty gave to this animal at the beginning points to its uncleanness. It is a curious coincidence that in Hindi this animal is called suar, which is a compound of su and ara. This also means I see it very foul. It should not be a matter of surprise that the Arabic word su should have found its way into Hindi. We have established in our book Mina Nur Rahman that Arabic is the mother of all languages and that many Arabic words are to be found in all languages. Thus su is an Arabic word and its equivalent in Hindi is bad. This animal is also called bad in Hindi. There is no doubt that at the time when Arabic was the universal language, this animal was known in this country by an Arabic name which was synonymous with Khinzair, and so it has continued to this day. It is possible that in Sanskrit this word might have undergone some transformation, but the true word is Khinzair, which proclaims its own meaning. It is not necessary to enter into a detailed exposition of the foulness of this animal. Everyone knows that it eats filth and is utterly shameless. Thus the, uh, the reason for the prohibition of its flesh is obvious, as by the law of nature its flesh would have a foul effect on the body and the soul of one who eats it. As we have already demonstrated, food affects a person's soul, and there can be no doubt that the flesh of such a foul animal would also be foul. Even in pre-Islamic times, Greek physicians had opined that the flesh of this animal particularly damages the faculty of modesty and fosters shamelessness. The eating of carrion is also prohibited in Islamic law for the same reason. That is to say, it affects the moral qualities adversely and is also harmful to physical health. The blood of an animal that is strangled or is beaten to death remains inside the body of the dead animal, and they are all carrion. It is obvious that the blood of such an animal is soon corrupted and corrupts the whole flesh. It is established by recent research that the germs in such blood spread a poisonous corruption in the flesh of the dead animal. Moral Condition of Man 
The second part of Quranic reform is that it regulates the natural conditions in such manner as to convert them into high moral qualities. This is a vast subject. If we were to set it forth in detail, this paper would become so lengthy that not one-tenth of it could be read out in the allotted time. We must therefore confine ourselves to the exposition of a few moral qualities by way of illustration. Moral qualities fall under two heads. First, those moral qualities that enable a person to discard evil and secondly, those moral qualities that enable him to do good. Discarding evil comprehends those qualities through which a person tries that he should do no harm to the property, honor, or life of a fellow being by his tongue or his hand or his eyes or by any other organ, nor should he design to do him such harm. The doing of good comprehends all those moral qualities whereby a person tries to benefit a fellow being in respect of his property or honor by his tongue or his hand or his knowledge or by any other means or determines to make manifest his glory or honor or overlooks a wrong that had been done to himself and thus benefits the perpetrator of the wrong by sparing him physical pain or financial imposition or inflicts such chastisement upon him in respect of the wrong, which is in reality a mercy for the wrongdoer. Moral qualities related to the discarding of evil. The moral qualities that the true Creator has appointed for the discarding of evil are known by four names in Arabic, which has a specific name for all human concepts, behaviors, and morals. The first of these moral qualities is called ihsan, which is to say chastity. This expression connotes the virtue that is related to the faculty of procreation of men and women. Those men and women would be called chaste, who refrain altogether from illicit sex and all approaches to it, the consequence of which is disgrace and humiliation for both parties in this world and chastisement in the hereafter, and dishonor and grave harm for those related to them. For instance, if a person is guilty of an approach towards the wife of another, which, though it does not proceed as far as adultery, yet re amounts to its preliminaries, it would become incumbent upon the self-respecting husband of the woman to divorce her on account of her willingness to tolerate such an approach. Her children would also be sadly afflicted. The husband would have to endure all this injury on account of the misconduct of a villain. It should be remembered that the moral quality of chastity would come into play when a person who possesses the capacity for the compassing of this particular vice restrains himself from indulging in it. If he does not possess that capacity because he is a minor or is impotent or is a eunuch, or has arrived at extreme old age, we cannot give him credit for the moral quality of chastity. He has a natural condition of chastity, but as we have repeatedly pointed out, natural conditions cannot be described as moral qualities. They become moral qualities when they are exercised or become capable of being exercised on their proper occasions under the control of reason. Therefore, Minors and impotent ones and those who deprive themselves in some way of sexual capacity cannot be given credit for this moral quality, though apparently they would be leading chaste lives. In all such cases, their chastity would only be a natural condition. As this vice and its preliminaries can be practiced by both men and women, the holy book of God sets forth directions for both men and women in this context. It says, وَلَا 
Direct the believing men to restrain their eyes from looking at women outside the prohibited degrees so openly as to be sexually excited by them and to cultivate the habit of guarding their looks. They should safeguard all their senses. For instance, they should not listen to the singing or beguiling voices of women outside the prohibited degrees, nor should they listen to descriptions of their beauty. This is a good way of preserving the purity of their looks and hearts. In the same way, direct believing women that they should restrain their eyes from looking at men outside the prohibited degrees and should safeguard their ears against listening to the passionate voices of such men. They should cover up their beauty and should not disclose it to anyone outside the prohibited degrees. They should draw their head coverings across their bosoms and should thus cover up their heads and ears and temples. They should not strike their feet on the ground like dancers. These are directions which can safeguard against moral stumbling. Chapter 24, verses 31 and 32. The second method is to turn to God Almighty and to supplicate Him to be safeguarded against stumbling and slipping. Another direction is approach not adultery. Chapter 17, verse 33. This means that one should avoid all occasions that might incite one's mind in that direction and should eschew all the paths that might lead to this vice. He who indulges in this vice carries his viciousness to the extreme. The way of adultery is an evil way as it obstructs one's progress towards the goal and is extremely harmful to the achievement of the purpose of life. Those who find no means of marriage should keep themselves chaste through the adoption of other means. Chapter 24, verse 34. For instance, through fasting or dieting or exercise. People sometimes adopt celibacy or submit to castration and take up monasticism. God has not prescribed monasticism, and that is why those who adopt it prove unable to conform to its discipline. Chapter 57, verse 28. This is an indication that if celibacy and monasticism had been imposed by the divine, everyone would have had to adopt this discipline, in which case the human race would have come to an end long ago. Also, if chastity had to be preserved through castration or any other such device, it would amount to criticism of the divine who has bestowed this capacity upon man. Besides, merit depends upon restraining the exercise of a capacity on an improper occasion through fear of God and thus acquiring double benefit through its proper exercise. By destroying the capacity of a person would deprive himself of both benefits. 
Merit depends upon the possession of the capacity and its proper regulation. What merit would a person acquire who has lost that capacity and has become like a child? Does a child deserve merit because of his chastity? Five Remedies Against Unchastity In these verses, God Almighty has not only set forth excellent teaching for acquiring the quality of chastity, but has furnished man with five remedies against unchastity. These are to restrain one's eyes from gazing on those who are outside the prohibited degrees, to restrain one's ears from listening to their voices and to descriptions of their good looks, to avoid occasions which might furnish incitement towards this vice, and to control one's self during the period of celibacy through fasting, dieting, etc. We can confidently claim that this excellent teaching with all its devices that is set forth in the Holy Koran is peculiar to Islam. It should be kept in mind that as the natural condition of man, which is the source of his passions, is such that he cannot depart from it without a complete change in himself, his passions are bound to be roused, or in other words, put in peril, when they are confronted with the occasion and opportunity for indulging in this vice. Therefore, God Almighty has not instructed us that we might freely gaze at women outside the prohibited degrees, and might contemplate their beauty and observe all their movements in dancing, etc., but that we should do so with pure looks. Nor have we been instructed to listen to the singing of these women and to lend ear to tales of their beauty, but that we should do so with a pure intent. We have been positively commanded not to look at their beauty, whether with pure intent or otherwise, nor to listen to their musical voices or to descriptions of their good looks, whether with pure intent or otherwise. We have been directed to eschew all this as we eschew carrion, so that we should not stumble. It is almost certain that our free glances would cause us to stumble some time or the other. As God Almighty desires that our eyes and our hearts and all our limbs and organs should continue in a state of purity, he has furnished us with this excellent teaching. There can be no doubt that unrestrained looks become a source of danger. If we place soft bread before a hungry dog, it would be vain to hope that the dog should pay no attention to it. Thus, God Almighty desired that human faculties should not be provided with any occasion for secret functioning and should not be confronted with anything that might incite dangerous tendencies. This is the philosophy that underlines the Islamic regulations relating to the observance of the veil. The Book of God does not aim at keeping women in seclusion like prisoners. This is the concept of those who are not acquainted with the correct pattern of Islamic ways. The purpose of these regulations is to restrain men and women from letting their eyes rove freely and from displaying their good looks and beauties, for therein lies the good both of men and of women. It should be remembered that to restrain one's looks and to direct them only toward observing that which is permissible is described in Arabic by the expression khade basar, which is the expression employed in the Holy Koran in this context. It does not behoove a pious person who desires to keep his heart pure that he should lift his eyes freely in every direction like an animal. It is necessary that such a one should cultivate the habit of khade basar in his social life. This is a blessed habit through which his natural impulses would be converted into a high moral quality without interfering with his social needs. This is the quality which is called chastity in Islam. The second quality in the context of the discarding of evil is the one known as honesty or integrity, that is to say, intolerance of the causing of harm to a fellow being by taking possession of his property dishonestly or unlawfully. Integrity is one of the natural conditions of man. That is why an infant who follows his natural bent and who has not yet acquired any bad habit so much 
dislikes anything belonging to another that it can only be persuaded with difficulty to be suckled by a wet nurse. If a wet nurse is not appointed for it while it is quite small and has not yet developed a keen consciousness, it becomes very difficult for a wet nurse to suckle it. It is naturally disinclined to be suckled by a woman other than its mother. This disinclination sometimes imposes great suffering upon it, and in extreme cases pushes it to the brink of death. What is the secret of this disinclination? It is that it naturally dislikes to leave its mother and to turn to something that belongs to another. When we reflect deeply upon this habit of an infant, it becomes clear that this habit is at the root of all honesty and integrity. No one can be credited with the quality of integrity unless his heart becomes charged with dislike and hatred of the property of another, as is the case with an infant. But an infant does not always employ this habit on its proper occasion, and consequently imposes great suffering upon itself. This habit is only a natural condition which it exhibits involuntarily. It is not therefore a moral quality, though it is at the root of the moral quality of integrity. As an infant cannot be described as religious-minded and trustworthy because of this habit, so also a person who does not exercise this natural habit on its proper occasion cannot be held to possess this moral quality. It is very difficult to become trustworthy and a person of integrity. Unless a person observes all aspects of integrity, he cannot be judged truly trustworthy or honest. In this context, God Almighty has instructed us in different aspects of integrity in the following verses. Wala to to sofaha amwala kumulati jalala hulakum kiamam varzoku hum fiha waksu hum wakululahum kalam marufa. وَابْتَلُوا الْيَتَامَا حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاحَ فَإِنَّا نَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ رُشْدًا فَادْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ وَلَا تَاكُلُوهَا إِسْرَافًا وَبِدَارًا نَنْ يَكْبَرُوا وَمَنْ كَانَ غَنِيًا ஃபலியாஸ்தாஃபிஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃபுஃப
and you should instruct him in all equitable values that would help to develop his reasoning and understanding and would furnish him with proper training so that he should not remain ignorant and inexperienced. If he is the son of a merchant, he may be instructed in the ways of business and commerce, and if his father followed some profession or other occupation, he may be given training in some appropriate occupation. Test him from time to time whether he is making progress in his training. When he arrives at the age of maturity, that is to say about 18 years, and you perceive that he has developed enough intelligence to look after his property, hand over his property to him. Do not deal with his property wastefully while it is in your charge, out of the apprehension that when he grows up he will take it over from you. If the custodian is in easy circumstances, he should not make any charge for administering the property. But if he is poor, let him make use of as much of it as is fair. The custom among Arab custodians of an orphan's property was that the property was used as capital for commerce and out of its profit provision was made for the orphan and thus the capital was not destroyed. The custodian made a fair charge for looking after the property. This is the system to which reference is made in these verses. Then it is said, when you hand over the property to its owner, you should do so before witnesses. Chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Those of you who are likely to leave behind minor children should give no directions by way of treatments which should operate unfairly against the children. Those who consume the substance of orphans unjustly only devour fire into their bellies and shall enter a blazing fire. Chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. It is to be observed how many aspects of honesty and integrity God Almighty has set forth in these verses. A truly honest person is one who keeps in mind all these aspects. If this is not done with perfect intelligence, his trustworthiness would cover many hidden dishonesties. Then it is directed, <laughs> Do not devour each other's substance through deceit and falsehood, nor offer your wealth as a bribe to the authorities, that you may deliberately acquire a part of other people's wealth through injustice. Chapter 2, verse 189. Make over the trusts to those entitled to them. Chapter 4, verse 59. Allah does not love those who are dishonest. Chapter 8, verse 59. Give full measure when you measure out and weigh out with a true balance. Chapter 17, verse 36. Do not deliver short and do not go about creating disorder in the land. Chapter 26, verse 184. This means that you should not go about in the land with an evil intent to commit theft or robbery or to pick pockets or to acquire the property of other people through unlawful means. Do not give that which is defective in exchange for that which is good. 
chapter 4, verse 3. That is to say, as embezzlement is unlawful, so the sale of defective articles representing them as being in good condition and the exchange of defective articles in return for good ones is also unlawful. In all these verses, God Almighty has set forth all dishonest practices in such a comprehensive way that no type of dishonesty has been omitted. He has not merely forbidden theft, lest a stupid person should consider that though theft is forbidden, all other improper methods of acquiring property are permitted. Forbidding all improper methods of acquiring property in a comprehensive way is true wisdom. In short, if a person does not possess the quality of integrity in all its aspects, he would not be considered honest even if he exhibits honesty in certain matters. That would be only his natural condition, shorn of reasonable discrimination and true insight. The third moral quality in the context of discarding evil is designated in Arabic as hudnah or chaun, which means refraining from inflicting physical pain on anyone and behaving peacefully. Without a doubt, peacefulness is a high moral quality and is essential for humanity. The natural impulse corresponding to this moral quality, the regulation of which converts it into a moral quality, which is possessed by an infant, is attachment. It is obvious that in his natural condition, man is unable to conceive of peacefulness or combativeness. In that condition, the impulse of attachment that he exhibits is the root of peacefulness, but as it is not exercised under the control of reason or reflection and with deliberation, it is not accounted a moral quality. It becomes a moral quality when a person deliberately makes himself harmless and exercises the quality of peacefulness on its proper occasion and refrains from using it out of place. In this context, the divine teaching is Try to promote accord between yourselves, chapter 8, verse 2. Peace is best, 4, 129. When they incline towards peace, do you incline towards it also, 8, verse 62. The true servants of the gracious one walk upon the earth in humility, chapter 25, verse 64. And when they come upon something vain, which would develop into strife, they pass on with dignity, 2573. That is to say, they do not start quarreling over trifles and do not make small matters which do not cause much harm and occasion for discord. The expression vain that is employed in this verse means mischievous utterance of words or doing something which causes little damage and does little harm. Peacefulness means that one should overlook conduct of that type and should act with dignity. But if a person's conduct does real harm to life or property or honor, the moral quality that should come into play in apposition to it is not peacefulness but forbearance to which we shall revert later. Should anyone behave mischievously towards you, you should try to repel it with peacefulness 
whereby he who is your enemy will become your warm friend. Chapter 41, verse 35. In short, peacefulness means overlooking trivial matters of annoyance which occasion no great harm and are more or less confined to uttering nonsense. The fourth moral quality in the context of discarding evil is courtesy or a good word. The natural impulse which is at the root of this moral quality is cheerfulness. Before an infant is able to express itself in words, it displays cheerfulness as a substitute for courtesy and good talk. That shows that the root of courtesy is cheerfulness, which is a natural faculty and is converted into the moral quality of courtesy by being used on its proper occasion. The divine teaching in this context is Say to people that which is good, chapter 2, verse 84. Let not one people deride another people. Haply they may be better than themselves. Nor let one group of women deride another. Haply the last may be better than the first. Defame not your people, nor call them names. Chapter 49, verse 12. Eschew too much suspicion. Also spy not, nor backbite one another. 49.13 Do not charge anyone with anything of which you have no proof. And remember that the ear and the eye and the heart will all be called to account. Chapter 17, verse 37 Moral qualities related to the doing of good. The second type of moral qualities are those that are related to doing good. The first of these is forbearance or forgiveness. He who commits an offense against another causes him pain or harm and deserves to be punished either through the process of the law with imprisonment or fine or directly by the person offended. To forgive him, if forgiveness should be appropriate, would be to do him good. In this context, the teaching of the Holy Quran is Those who control their tempers when they are roused and who overlook people's faults when that is appropriate. Chapter 3, verse 135. The recompense of an injury is a penalty in proportion thereto. But whoso forgives and effects thereby a reform in the offender and no harm is apprehended, that is to say, exercises forgiveness on its appropriate occasion, will have his reward with Allah. Chapter 42, verse 41. 
This verse shows that the Koran does not teach non-resistance to evil on all occasions or that mischief makers and wrongdoers should never be punished. Its teaching is that one must consider whether the occasion calls for forgiveness or punishment and to adopt the course which would be best in the interests both of the offender and the public. Sometimes an offender turns away from wrongdoing in consequence of being forgiven, and sometimes forgiveness incites him to further wrongdoing. Therefore, God Almighty directs that we should not develop the habit of forgiving blindly on all occasions, but should consider carefully whether forgiveness or punishment would be most appropriate, and therefore a virtue in each particular case, and should adopt that course. Some people are so vindictive that they keep in mind the wrongs done to their fathers through generations, and there are others who carry forbearance and forgiveness to the extreme, sometimes even to the limit of shamelessness. They exercise such weakness, forgiveness, and forbearance as are utterly inconsistent with dignity, honor, and chastity. Their conduct is a stain on good character, and the result of their forgiveness and forbearance is that people are disgusted with them. That is why the Holy Koran attaches the condition of appropriate time and place for the exercise of every moral quality, and does not approve the exercise of a moral quality out of its place. It should be remembered that forgiveness is not a moral quality in itself. It is a natural impulse which is found in children also. A child soon forgets an injury if it is inflicted upon him wrongfully and again approaches affectionately the person who has inflicted the injury upon him even if such a person should intend to kill him. He is pleased with his beguiling words. Such forgiveness is in no sense a moral quality. It would become a moral quality when it is exercised in its proper place and on its proper occasion. Otherwise, it would only be a natural impulse. There are few people who are able to distinguish between a natural impulse and a moral quality. We have repeatedly pointed out the distinction between a true moral quality and a natural condition, which is that a moral quality is conditioned by conformity to place and occasion, and a natural impulse often comes into play out of place. A cow is harmless, and a goat is humble, but we do not attribute these qualities to them because they are in, not invested with a sense of time and place. Divine wisdom and God's true and perfect book have made every moral quality subject to time and place for its proper exercise. The second moral quality in this category is equity, and the third is benevolence, and the fourth is graciousness as between kindred God the Glorious has said, this means that we are commanded to return good for good and to exercise benevolence when it is called for and to do good with natural eagerness as between kindred when that should be appropriate. Chapter 16, verse 91. God Almighty forbids transgression or that you should exercise benevolence out of place or should refrain from exercising it when it is called for or that you should fall short of exercising graciousness as between kindred on its proper occasion, or should extend it beyond its, pro uh, its appropriate limit. This verse sets forth three gradations of doing good. The first is the doing of good in return for good. This is the lowest gradation, and even an average person can easily acquire this gradation, that he should do good to those who do good to him. The second gradation is a little more difficult than the first, and that is to take the initiative in doing good out of pure benevolence. This is the middle grade. Most people act benevolently towards the poor, but there is a hidden deficiency in benevolence that the person exercising benevolence is conscious of it and desires gratitude or prayer in return for his benevolence. If on any occasion the other person should turn against him, he considers him ungrateful. 
On occasion, he reminds him of his benevolence or puts some heavy burden upon him. The benevolent ones have been admonished by God Almighty. La tubtelu sadaqatikum bil manne valada Al-Baqara, 255 Render not vain your alms by reproaches or injury. Chapter 2, verse 265. The Arabic word for alms, sadaqa, is derived from a root sidq, that means sincerity. If the heart is not inspired by sincerity in bestowing alms, the alms giving ceases to be alms and becomes mere display. That is why those who exercise benevolence have been admonished by God Almighty not to render vain their benevolence by reproaches or injury. The third grade of doing good is graciousness as between kindred. God Almighty directs that in this grade there should be no idea of benevolence or any desire for gratitude, but good should be done out of such eager sympathy as, for instance, a mother does good to her child. This is the highest grade of doing good which cannot be exceeded. But God Almighty has conditioned all these grades of doing good with their appropriate time and place. The verse cited above clearly indicates that if these virtues are not exercised in their proper places, they would become vices. For instance, if equity exceeds its limits, it would take on an unwholesome aspect and would become indecent. In the same way, Misuse of benevolence would take on a form which would be repelled by reason and conscience, and in the same way graciousness between kindred would become transgression. The Arabic word for transgression is baghi, which connotes excessive rain which ruins crops, a deficiency in the discharge of an obligation or an excess in its discharge are both baghi. In short, Whichever of these three qualities is exercised out of place becomes tainted. That is why they are all three qualities conditioned by the due observance of place and occasion. It should be remembered that equity or benevolence or graciousness between kindred are not in themselves moral qualities. They are man's natural conditions and faculties that are exhibited even by children before they develop their reason. Reason is a condition of the exercise of a moral quality, and there is also a condition that every moral quality should be exercised in its proper place and on its proper occasion. There are several other directions set out in the Holy Koran concerning benevolence, which are all made subject to the condition of place and time. It is said, <laughs> Thank you. 
generosity or benevolence or charity such of your wealth as you have acquired lawfully, that is to say, no part of which has been acquired through theft or bribery or dishon dishonesty or embezzlement or wrongdoing. Do not select for charity out of it that which is useless or unclean. Chapter 2, verse 268. Render not vain your alms with reproaches or injury, that is to say, never remind your doni that you had bestowed anything on him, nor inflict any injury upon him, for in such case your charity would be rendered vain, nor spend your money merely for display. Chapter 2, verse 265. Be benevolent towards your fellow beings, for Allah loves those who are benevolent. Chapter 2, verse 196. The truly virtuous shall drink of a cup tempered with camphor. Chapter 76, verses 6 and 7. 
The reference to camphor means that their hearts will be cleansed of all the burning desires and impure urges of the world. The root of the Arabic word for camphor connotes suppression or covering up, which means that their illicit emotions will be suppressed and they will become pure-hearted and will enjoy the coolness of understanding. Then it is said that they will drink from a spring which they shall cause to gush forth from the earth through their efforts. Chapter 76, verse 8. This indicates a deep mystery of the philosophy of paradise. Let him who has understanding understand it. The truly virtuous feed the poor, the orphan, and the captive for the love of Allah with such foods as they eat themselves, assuring them, We are not laying you under any obligation, but feed you only to win Allah's pleasure. We desire no return or thanks from you. Chapter 76, verses 9 and 10. This is an indication that they exercise the third grade of doing good, which proceeds out of pure sympathy. The truly virtuous are in the habit of spending their wealth out of love of God on their kindred and on the upbringing and training of orphans and in making provision for the poor and for providing comfort for travelers and for those who ask and for procuring the freedom of slaves and discharging the burdens of those who are in debt. Chapter 2, verse 178. They are neither extravagant nor niggardly, but keep a balance between the two. Chapter 25, verse 68. They join together that which Allah has bidden to be joined and fear their Lord. 13.22 In their wealth, those who ask and those who are unable to ask have a right. 51.20 But those who are unable to ask are meant animals such as dogs, cats, sparrows, oxen, donkeys, goats, and others that cannot express their needs in words. They do not hold back in times of scarcity or famine, but continue to spend at such times also according to their capacity. Chapter 3, verse 135. They spend in charity secretly and openly. 1323. Secretly so that they might safeguard themselves against displaying their charity and openly so that they might set an example for others. That which is set aside for charity should be spent on the poor and the needy and on those employed in connection with its collection and distribution and to help those who have to be rescued from some evil and on procuring the freedom of slaves and on those burdened with debts and the afflicted and on other purposes which are purely for the sake of God and on those striving in the cause of Allah. Chapter 9, verse 60. You cannot attain the highest grade of virtue unless you spend for the promotion of the welfare of your fellow beings that part of your wealth which you hold dear. Chapter 3, verse 93. Render to the poor their due, and to the needy and the wayfarer, but safeguard yourselves against extravagance. Chapter 17, verse 27. This is a direction to restrain people from spending unnecessarily on weddings and luxuries and on the occasion of the birth of a child, etc. Be benevolent toward parents and kindred and orphans and the needy and the neighbor who is a kinsman and the neighbor who is not related to you and the wayfarer and your servants and your horses and your cattle and your other animals that you possess. This is what God loves he loves not those who are heedless and selfish and those who are niggardly and enjoin other people to be niggardly and conceal their wealth and tell those who are needy that they have nothing which they can give them. Chapter 4, verses 37 and 38. True Courage One of the natural conditions of man is one which resembles courage as an infant sometimes seeks to thrust his hand into the fire on account of its natural condition of fearlessness. In that condition, a person fearlessly confronts tigers and other wild beasts and issues forth alone to fight a large number of people. Such a one is considered very brave, 
but this is only a natural condition that is found even in savage animals and in dogs. True courage, which is one of the high moral qualities, is conditioned by place and occasion, which are mentioned in the Holy Word of God as follows. Those who are steadfast in adversity and under affliction and in battle, chapter 2, verse 178, their steadfastness is for the purpose of seeking the countenance of Allah and not for the display of bravery, 13.23. They are threatened that people have gathered together to persecute them and they should be afraid of them, but this only adds to their faith and they say, sufficient for us is Allah. Chapter 3, verse 174. Thus their courage and bravery are not like that of dogs and wild animals which proceed from natural passions and are only one-sided. Their courage has two aspects. Sometimes they contend out of their personal courage against the passions of their selves and overcome them. And sometimes when they feel that it is appropriate to fight against an enemy, they issue forth against him not out of any urge of a roused self, but for the support of truth. They do not depend upon their selves, but trust in God and behave courageously. They do not issue forth from their homes insolently and to be seen of people. Their only purpose is to win the pleasure of God. Chapter 8, verse 48. These verses illustrate that true courage derives from steadfastness. To be steadfast against every personal passion or against any calamity that attacks like an enemy and not to run away out of cowardice is true courage. Thus, there is a great difference between human courage and the courage of a wild beast. A wild animal is moved only in one direction when it is roused, but a man who possesses true courage chooses confrontation or non-resistance, whichever might be appropriate to the occasion. Truthfulness. One of the natural qualities of man is truthfulness. Normally, unless a person is moved by some selfish motive, he does not wish to tell a lie. He is averse to falsehood and is reluctant to have recourse to it. He is displeased with a person who is proved to have told a lie, and he looks down upon him. But this natural inclination cannot be accounted a moral quality. Even children and the insane exhibit it. Unless a person discards those purposes which lead him away from telling the truth, he cannot be considered truthful. If a person tells the truth where no personal interest is involved, but is ready to have recourse to a falsehood where his honor or property or life is concerned and fails to tell the truth, he is no better than a child or an insane person. Do not the insane and minors speak such truth? There is scarcely anyone in the world who would tell a lie without any purpose. The truth that might be abandoned in order to escape some loss that threatens is not a moral quality. The proper occasion of telling the truth is when one apprehends loss of life or property or honor. In this context, divine teaching is... Vaishtanibu Kola Zoo Al Hajj, 
ਸਿਤਰਤੀ ਵਲਾ ਯਾ ਬਸੁ ਹਦਾ ਓਏ ਦਾ ਮਾਦੂ ਅਲ ਬਕਰਾ 213 ਵਲਾ ਤਕਤੁਮ ਸ਼ਹਾਦਾ ਵਮਨ ਯਕਤੁਮ ਹਾ ਫਨਹੂ ਹਾਸਿਮੁਨ ਫਲਬੋ ਅਲਬਕਰਾ 214 ਵਾਇਦਾ ਕੁਲਤੁਮ ਫਾਦਿਲੂ ਵਲੋਕਾ ਨਜ਼ਾ ਕੁਰਬਾ ਅਲਾ ਨਾਮ 153 ਉਨੁ ਕਵਾਮਿਨ ਬਿਲ ਕਿਸਤੇ ਸੁਹਦਾ ਲਿਲਾਹ ਵਲਾ ਵਲਾਨ ਫਸਕੁਮ ਮਵਿਲ ਵਾਲਿਦੈਨ ਵਲ ਅਕਰਬੀ ਅਨਸਾ ਇਸ ਸਤਿ ਵਲਾ ਯਜਰੇ ਮਨਕੁਮ ਸਨਾਨੋ ਕੌਮਿਨ ਅਲਾ ਅੱਲਾ ਤਾਦਿਲ ਅਲਮਾਇਦਾ 9 ਵਸਾਦਿਕੀਨ ਵਸਾਦਿਕਾ ਅਲਾਜ਼ਾਬ ਸਤੀ ਵਤਵਾਸੋ ਬਿਲ ਹੱਕ ਵਤਵਾਸੋ ਬਿਲ ਸਬਰ ਅਲਾਤਰ ਦਾ ਲਾ ਯਸ਼ਦੂਨ ਅਲਫਕਾਨ shun the abomination of idols and shun all words of falsehood in chapter 22 verse 31 this shows that falsehood is also an idol and he who relies upon it ceases to trust in god thus by uttering a lie one loses god when you are called upon to testify to the truth do not fail to do so chapter 2 verse 283 and do not conceal true testimony and he who conceals it has a sinful heart to 284 when you speak tell the truth and hold the scales even though the person concerned be your kinsman chapter 6 verse 153 be strict in observing justice and bear witness only for the sake of allah even if it should occasion loss to you or your parents or your kinsmen or sons etc chapter 4 verse 136 let not the enmity of a people toward you incite you to injustice or falsehood chapter 5 verse 9 truthful men and truthful women will have a great reward from allah chapter 33 verse 36 they exhort one another to hold fast to the truth 103 4 those who do not keep company with the untruthful 25 73 steadfastness one of the natural qualities of man is steadfastness during illness and under afflictions he has recourse to patience after much complaining and sorrowing it is natural that a person cries and groans under affliction and in the end after giving vent to his grievance he beats a retreat both these conditions are natural but are not in any sense part of a moral quality in this context the relevant moral quality is that when one suffers a loss one should consider it as rendering back to god that which he had bestowed and should utter no complaint about it one should affirm that it was a bounty of god which he has recalled and that one is reconciled to god's pleasure in this context the holy quran admonishes us wala nablu wanakum bisam min al khauf wal du wa naqsin min al amwal wal anqus wa samara وبشر الصابرين الذين اذا اصابتهم مصيبه قالوا ان لله وانا اليه راجعون اولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمه واولئك هم المهتدون ਅਲ ਬਕਰਾ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਸਪੰਦਾ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਅਠਾਵਾਂ
We shall surely try you with somewhat of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and of the fruits of your labor, and sometimes your dear children will die. Then give glad tidings to the steadfast who, when a misfortune overtakes them, do not lose heart but affirm, We belong to God and are his servants, and to him shall we return. It is these on whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy, and it is these who are rightly guided. Chapter 2, verses 156 and 7. This moral quality is called steadfastness or reconciliation to the divine will. From one aspect it might be called equity or justice. Throughout a person's life, God Almighty manifests thousands of matters in accord with the wishes of a person and bestows numberless bounties upon him so that it would be inequitable on his part that on such occasions when God calls upon him to submit to his will, he should turn away not pleased with the will of God and should be critical or lose faith or go astray. Sympathy for Mankind Of the natural qualities of man is his sympathy for his fellow beings. The followers of every religion have natural sympathy for their own people, and many of them, under the urge of such sympathy, act wrongfully towards other people, as if they do not regard them as human beings. This state cannot be described as a moral quality. It is a natural urge which is manifested even by birds. For instance, when one crow dies, hundreds of crows flock together. This quality would be accounted a high moral quality when it is exercised on its proper occasion, justly and equitably. It would be a great moral quality which is designated sympathy both in Arabic and Persian. This is referred to by Allah, the exalted in the Holy Quran. God Almighty has directed in the Holy Quran. <laughs> Assist one another in piety and rectitude, and assist not one another in sin and transgression. Chapter 5, verse 3. Slacken not in serving your fellow beings. 4. 105. Contend not on behalf of the treacherous. 4. 106. Plead not on behalf of those who persist in being unfaithful. Allah loves not those who are perfidious. Chapter 4. Verse 108. Footnote. Here, Hudhur mentions two categories of verses. In the first category are those verses which deal with compassion for God's creation and with the idea of collaboration in the doing of good deeds. In the second category, the subject of discussion is the punishment of the wrongdoer when the situation so demands. The message being conveyed is that sympathy for humankind does not mean that the culprit merely be punished for his wrongdoings, thus securing the rest of society from his transgressions. In fact, punishing him is an aspect of sympathy for humankind. The Publishers Search for an Exalted Being of the natural conditions of man is his search after an exalted being towards whom he has an inherent attraction. This is manifested by an infant from the moment of its birth. As soon as it is born, it displays a spiritual characteristic that it inclines toward its mother 
and is inspired by love of her. As its faculties are developed and its nature begins to display itself openly, this inherent quality is displayed more and more strongly. It finds no comfort anywhere except in the lap of its mother. If it is separated from her and finds itself at a d distance from her, its life becomes bitter. Heaps of bounties fail to beguile it away from its mother in whom all its joy is concentrated. It feels no joy apart from her. What then is the nature of the attraction which an infant feels so strongly toward its mother? It is the attraction which the true creator has implanted in the nature of man. The same attraction comes into play whenever a person feels love for another. It is a reflection of the attraction that is inherent in man's nature towards God, as if he is in search of something that he misses, the name of which he has forgotten and which he seeks to find in one thing or another which he takes up from time to time. A person's love of wealth or offspring or wife or his soul being attracted towards a musical voice are all indications of his search for the true beloved. As man cannot behold with his physical eyes the imperceptible being, who is latent like the quality of fire in everyone, but is hidden, nor can he discover him through the mere exercise of imperfect reason, he has been misled grievously in his search and has mistakenly assigned his position to others. The Holy Koran has, in this context, set forth an excellent illustration to the effect that the world is like a palace, the floor of which is paved with smooth slabs of glass under which flows a rapid current of water. Every eye that beholds this floor mistakenly imagines it to be running water. A person fears to tread upon the floor as he would be afraid of treading upon running water though in reality the floor is only paved with smooth, transparent slabs of glass. Thus, these heavenly bodies, like the sun and the moon, etc., are the smooth and transparent slabs of glass under which a great power is in operation like a fast-flowing current of water. It is a great mistake on the part of those who worship these heavenly bodies that they attribute to them that which is manifested by the power that operates behind them. This is the interpretation of the verse of the Holy Koran. It is a great hall paved with smooth slabs of glass. Chapter 27, verse 45. In short, as the being of God Almighty, despite its brilliance, is utterly hidden, this physical system that is spread out before our eyes is not alone sufficient for its recognition. That is why those who have depended upon this system and have observed carefully its perfect and complete orderliness together with all the wonders comprehended in it and have thoroughly studied astronomy, physics, and philosophy and have, as it were, penetrated into the heavens and the earth, have yet not been delivered from the darkness of doubts and suspicions. Many of them become involved in grave errors and wander far away in pursuit of their stupid fancies. Their utmost conjecture is that this grand system which displays great wisdom must have a maker, and this conjecture is incomplete and this insight is defective. The affirmation that this system must have a creator does not amount to a positive affirmation that he does in truth exist. Such a conjecture cannot bestow satisfaction upon the heart, nor remove all doubt from it, nor is it a draft which can quench the thirst for complete understanding which man's nature demands. Indeed, this defective understanding is most dangerous, for despite all its noise, it amounts to nothing. In short, unless God Almighty affirms his existence through his word, as he has manifested it through his work, the observation of the work alone does not afford complete satisfaction. Footnote. This means that without the word of God, contemplation of and foresight into the laws of nature cannot be sufficient. The publishers. For instance, if we are confronted by a room, the door of which is bolted from, out, from inside, 
Our immediate reaction would be that there is someone inside the room who has bolted the door from inside, inasmuch as it is apparently impossible to bolt a door from inside by some device employed for the purpose from the outside. But if, despite persistent calls from the outside over a period of years, no response becomes audible from inside, our supposition that there must be someone inside would have to be abandoned and we would be compelled to conclude that the door has been bolted from inside through some clever device. This is the situation in which those philosophers have placed themselves whose understanding is limited solely to the observation of the work of God. It is a great mistake to imagine that God is like a corpse interred in the earth whose recovery is the business of man. If God has only been discovered through human effort, it is vain to expect anything from him. Indeed, God has, through eternity, called mankind to himself by affirming, I am present. It would be a great impertinence to imagine that man has laid God under an obligation by discovering him through his own effort, and that if there had been no philosophers, he would have continued unknown. It is equally stupid to inquire how can God speak unless he has a tongue to speak with. The answer is, has he not created the earth and the heavenly bodies without physical hands? Does he not view the universe without eyes? Does he not hear our supplications without physical ears? Then is it not necessary that he should also speak to us? Nor is it correct to say that God spoke in the past but does not speak now. We cannot limit his word or his discourse to any particular time. He is as ready today to enrich his seekers from the fountain of revelation as he was at any given time, and uh, the gates of his grace are as wide open today as they were at any time. It is true, however, that as the need for a perfect law has been fulfilled, all law and limitations have been completed. Also, all prophethoods, having arrived at their climax in the person of our Lord and Master, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, have been fulfilled. The reason for the appearance of the Holy Prophet in Arabia. That the last divine guidance should shine forth from Arabia was determined by divine wisdom. The Arabs are descended from Ishmael, who was cut asunder from Israel and had, under divine wisdom, been cast into the wilderness of Paran, or Faran, which means two fugitives. <clears throat> the descendants of Ishmael had been cut asunder from Bani Israel by Abraham himself, and they had no part in the law of the Torah, as was written that they would not inherit from Isaac. Thus they were abandoned by those to whom they belonged and had no relationship with anyone else. In all other countries there were some traces of worship and commandments which indicated that they had at one time received instruction from prophets. Arabia alone was a country that was utterly unacquainted with such teachings and was the most backward of all. Its turn came last of all and it received the benefit of a universal prophethood so that all countries might share again in the blessings of prophethood and the errors that had become current in the meantime among them might be weeded out. The Holy Koran is the perfect book which undertook the entire project of human reform and is not addressed only to one people. It seeks the reform of all and has set forth all grades of human development. It teaches savages the manners and ways of humanity and thereafter instructs them in high moral qualities. Thus there is no need of any other book besides the Holy Koran. What the world owes to the Holy Koran. It is a bounty of the Holy Koran upon mankind that it has set forth the distinction between man's natural state and moral qualities, and that it does not stop merely at leading man from his natural conditions to the elevated palace of high moral qualities, but also opens the doors of the holy understanding that leads man to the spiritual heights. In this way, it sets forth in an excellent manner the three types of teaching that we have already mentioned. 
as it comprehends all the teachings which are necessary for religious training, it claims it has discharged this function to perfection. It says, <laughs> This day have I perfected your religion for your benefit and have completed my favor unto you and have been pleased to appoint Islam as your religion. Chapter 5, verse 4. This means the climax of religion has been reached in Islam, which is that a person should be committed wholly to God and should seek his salvation through the sacrifice of his self in the cause of God and not through any other means, and should demonstrate this motive and determination in his conduct. This is the stage at which all excellences arrive at their perfection. Thus the Holy Koran has presented the God who was not identified by the philosophers. The Koran has adopted two methods for the understanding of God. First, the method whereby human reason is strengthened and illumined for the purpose of setting forth reasons in support of the existence of God and thus saves a person from falling into error. Secondly, the spiritual method which we shall set forth in answer to the third question. Proof of the Existence of God We now proceed to draw attention to the excellent and matchless proofs of the existence of God that the Holy Koran has set forth. At one place it has said, Our Lord is He who has bestowed upon everything its appropriate faculties and has then guided it to the achievement of its appropriate purposes. Chapter 20, verse 51. If we keep in mind the purport of this verse and then reflect upon the shape and form of man and all the animals on land and in the sea and the birds, we are impressed with the power of God who has bestowed its appropriate form on everything. This is a vast subject, and we would urge our listeners to reflect deeply upon it. The second proof of the existence of God that the Holy Koran has set forth is that God is the ultimate cause of all causes, as it is said, The Lord is the final cause of all causes. Chapter 53, verse 43. If we observe carefully, we find that the entire universe is bound together in a system of cause and effect. This system is at the root of all knowledge. No part of creation is outside this system. Some things are the roots of others, and some are branches. A cause may be primary or may be the effect of another cause, and that in its turn may be the effect of still another cause, and so on. Now, it is not possible that in this finite world this pattern of cause and effect should have no limit and should be infinite. We are compelled to acknowledge that it must terminate with some ultimate cause. The ultimate cause is God. This verse sets forth this argument very concisely and affirms that the system of cause and effect terminates in God. Chapter 53, verse 43. Another proof of divine existence set forth in the Koran is This means that the sun cannot catch up with the moon, and the night, which is a manifestation of the moon, cannot prevail over the day, which is a manifestation of the sun. Neither of them can move outside its orbit. Chapter 36, verse 41. Were there not a regulator of the whole of this system behind the scenes, the system would fall into chaos. 
This proof is very striking in the estimation of astronomers. There are so many grand heavenly bodies that are gliding through space that the slightest disorder in their movements would bring about the ruin of the whole world. What a manifestation of divine power is it that these bodies neither collide nor change their speed, nor alter their courses in the slightest degree, nor have they been worn out by their circulation during such a long period, nor has their machinery suffered any disorder. If they are not under the supervision of a guardian, how is it that such a grand organization continues to carry on through numberless years entirely on its own? At another place in the Koran, God Almighty draws attention to this in the words, <laughs> Can there be a doubt in the existence of God who has originated the heavens and the earth? Chapter 14, verse 11. He has set forth another proof of his existence in the words, all that is on the earth will perish, and only the countenance of the Lord, Master of glory and honor, will survive. Chapter 55, verses 27 and 8. If we assume that the earth might be reduced into particles and the heavenly bodies might be broken down and everything might be overtaken by a blast that would wipe out every sign of these bodies, yet reason acknowledges and right conscience deems it necessary that after all this destruction there should survive one who is not subject to destruction and can undergo no change and who should continue in his pristine state, that one is God, who has created everything mortal and is himself immune from mortality. Another proof of his existence that God has set forth in the Holy Koran is God inquired from the souls. <laughs> Am I not your Lord? And they answered, Indeed. Chapter 7, verse 173. In this verse, God Almighty sets forth in the form of question and answer the characteristic with which he has invested the souls, and that is that by its very nature no soul can deny the existence of God. Those who deny God do so because they can find no proof of his existence according to their own fancy. Yet they acknowledge that for everything that is created there must be a creator. There is no one in the world so stupid that if he falls ill he would insist that there is no cause for his illness. If the system of the universe had not been made up of cause and effect it would not have been possible to predict the time of a tornado or of the eclipse of the sun or the moon or that a patient would die at a certain time or that a disease would be reinforced by another disease at a certain stage. Thus, a research scholar who does not acknowledge the existence of God, in effect, does so indirectly, for he too, like us, searches for the causes of effects. This is an acknowledgment of a sort, though it is not perfect. Besides, if, through some device, a person who denies the existence of God could be made unconscious in such manner that he should pass under the complete control of God, discarding all fancies, emotions, and impulses of his earthly life, he would, in such a state, acknowledge the existence of God and would not deny it. This is testified to by eminent experts. The verse that we have cited also indicates that a denial of the existence of God is only a manifestation of this earthly existence, for the true nature of man fully confesses his existence. Attributes of God We have set forth these few proofs of the existence of God by way of illustration. We now call attention to the attributes of God to whom the Holy Koran calls us, which are as follows. Allahu 
This means that God is one without associate and no one else beside him is worthy of worship and obedience. Chapter 59, verse 23. This affirmation is made because if he were not without associate, there might be an apprehension that he might be overcome by a rival, in which case Godhead would always be in peril. The affirmation that no one is worthy of worship beside him means that he is so perfect and his attributes are so excellent and exalted that if we were to select a God out of the universe who would be equipped with perfect attributes or were to contemplate in our minds the best and most exalted attributes that God should possess, he would be more exalted than all our fancies. Whom no one can exceed and than whom no one can be more exalted. That is God, to associate anyone in whose worship would be the greatest wrong. He is the knower of the unseen, that is to say, he alone knows himself. No one can comprehend his being. We can comprehend the sun and the moon in their entirety, but we cannot comprehend God in his entirety. He is the knower of the seen, that is to say, nothing is hidden from him. It is not to be imagined that he should be unaware of anything. He has every particle of the universe within his sight, but man does not possess such comprehensive vision. He knows when he might break up this system and bring about the judgment. No one else knows when that would happen. It is God alone who has knowledge of all those times. Then it is said, He is the gracious one. Chapter 59, verse 23. This means that before the coming into being of animates and before any action proceeding from them, out of his pure grace and not for any other purpose, nor as a reward for any action, he makes due provision for everyone. As, for instance, he brought into being the sun and the earth and all other things for our benefit before we came into being and before any action had proceeded from us. This divine bounty is designated Ramaniyat in the Book of God and on account of God Almighty is called Raman. 
He rewards righteous action richly and does not let go, waste anyone's effort. So written. On account of this attribute, he is called Rahim, and the attribute is designated Rahimiyat. Then it is said, Maliki Yomidin. He is master of the day of judgment, chapter 1, verse 4. This means that he keeps the recompense of everyone in his own hand. He has appointed no agent to whom he has committed the governance of the heavens and the earth, having withdrawn from it altogether, being no longer concerned with it, leaving to the agent the determination of all recompense at all times. Then it is said, Al-Malikul Quddus. He is the sovereign without any default. Chapter 59, verse 24. It is obvious that human sovereignty is not without default. For instance, if all the subjects of an earthly sovereign were to leave their country and to migrate to another country, his sovereignty would come to an end. Or if all his people were afflicted with famine, how could any revenue be collected? Or if the people were to inquire from him, what is it that he possesses beyond that which they possess, on account of which they should obey him, what could he say in answer to their question? But God's sovereignty is not subject to any default. He can destroy everything in one instant and can create another kingdom. Had he not been such a creator, possessing all power, his kingdom would not have endured without injustice. For instance, having forgiven and having bestowed salvation upon the people of the world once, how would he have acquired another world? Would he have sought to catch those upon whom he had already bestowed salvation so that he might send them back into the world and would have revoked his forgiveness and salvation unjustly? In such case, his Godhead would have proved defective and he would have become an imperfect ruler like earthly sovereigns who frame ever new laws for their people and are put out of temper time after time. And when they find in their selfishness that they cannot carry on without injustice, they have recourse to it without compunction. For instance, in terrestrial sovereignty, it is considered permissible to let the passengers of a small vessel be destroyed in order to secure the safety of a large vessel, but God is under no such compulsion. If God had not been all-powerful and had not had the power to create out of nothing, he would have been compelled either to have recourse to injustice like weak sovereigns or would have clung to justice and lost his Godhead. God's vessel continues its voyage with full power on the basis of justice. Then he is the source of peace, chapter 59, verse 24. That is to say, he is safeguarded against all defects and misfortunes and hardships and provides security for all. If he had been liable to being afflicted with misfortunes or to be killed by his people or could have been frustrated in his designs, how could the hearts of people in such cases have been comforted by the conviction that he would deliver them from misfortunes? God Almighty describes the condition of false gods in the following words. Those on whom you call beside Allah cannot create even a fly, though they should all combine together for the purpose. And if a fly should snatch away anything from them, they cannot recover it therefrom. Their worshippers lack intelligence, and they themselves lack power. Can such as these be gods? 
God is one who is more powerful than all those who possess power. He is the mighty who is supreme over all. No one can apprehend him or kill him. Those who fall into such errors have not a true concept of God's attributes. Chapter 22, verses 74 and 5. Then God is the bestower of security and sets forth proof of his attributes and his unity. This is an indication that he who believes in the true God is not embarrassed in any company, nor would he be remorseful in the presence of God, for he is equipped with strong proofs. But he who believes in a false God finds himself in great distress. He describes every senseless thing as a mystery, so that he should not be laughed at and seeks to hide demonstrable errors. Then he is the protector, the mighty, the subduer, the exalted. This means that he safeguards all and is supreme over all and sets right all that might have gone wrong and is completely self-sufficient. Chapter 59, verse 24. He is Allah, the creator, the maker, the fashioner. His are the most beautiful names. All that is in the heavens and the earth glorifies him. He is the mighty, the wise. Chapter 59, verse 25. This means that he is the creator of the bodies as well as of the souls. He determines the features of a baby in the womb. To him belong all the beautiful names that can be thought of. The dwellers of the heaven and the dwellers of the earth glorify him. This is an indication that the heavenly bodies are also populated and their dwellers follow divine guidance. He has the power to do all that he wills. Chapter 2, verse 21. This provides great comfort for his worshippers, for what can be expected of a God who is weak and without power? Then it is said, he is the Lord of the worlds, most gracious, ever merciful, master of the day of judgment, chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. This means that he provides for the universe and is himself the master of the day of judgment and has not committed judgment to anyone else. Then it is said, I respond to the call of him who calls on me. Chapter 2, verse 187. Al-Hayyul The ever-living, the self-subsisting, and the self-sufficient. Chapter 2, verse 256. The life of every life and the support of every being. He is the ever-living, for if he were not ever-living, his worshippers would be apprehensive, lest he should die before them. Then it is said, Proclaim, he is Allah, the single. He begets not, nor is he begotten. And there is no one who is his equal or like unto him. Chapter 112, verses 2 to 5. To believe in the unity of God correctly without the least deviation is the justice that is due from a man towards his maker. We have set out the moral teachings of Islam from the Holy Quran, the, be print, uh, the basic principle of which is that there should be neither excess nor deficiency. It is the characteristic of a moral quality that it does not exceed or fall short of its appropriate limit. It is obvious that virtue lies in the middle of two extremes. Only that habit which seeks to establish itself in the middle promotes a high moral quality. To recognize the proper place and occasion is itself a middle. For instance, if a farmer does his sowing too early or too late, he departs from the middle. Virtue and truth and wisdom are the middle, and the middle is appropriateness. In other words, truth is always in the middle of two opposing falsehoods. There is no doubt that watchfulness for the proper occasion keeps a person in the middle. Keeping to the middle in relation to God means that in expounding divine attributes, one should not lean towards negating divine attributes nor describe God as resembling material things. This is the way that the Holy Koran has adopted with reference to divine attributes. 
It affirms that God sees, hears, knows, speaks, and as a safeguard against his being understood as resembling his creation, it also affirms Ashura Bara Pala Tadrebu Lilla Hilam Sal Anahal Pachatar. There is nothing like unto him. Chapter forty two, verse twelve. And fabricate not similitudes concerning God. Sixteen seventy five. This means that there is no partner in the being and attributes of God and that he bears no resemblance to his creatures. To conceive of God as being between resemblance and transcendence is the proper middle. In short, all Islamic teachings observe the middle. The Surah Fatiha also inculcates adherence to the middle. It teaches the supplication to be guided along the path of those on whom God has bestowed his favors and not of those who have incurred his wrath, nor of those who have gone astray. Chapter 1, verse 7. By those who incurred his wrath are meant people who, in juxtaposition to God, yield to the wrathful faculty and act savagely, and by those who have gone astray are meant people who behave like animals. The middle way is that which has been described as the way of those on whom God has bestowed his favors. In short, for this blessed people, the Holy Koran has prescribed adherence to the middle. In the Torah, God Almighty had laid emphasis on retribution, and in the Gospel, he laid emphasis on forbearance and forgiveness. The Muslims have been directed to seek appropriateness and to adhere to the middle, as is said, <laughs> Thus have we made you the people of the middle. Chapter 2, verse 144. Meaning that the Muslims have been directed to keep to the middle. Thus blessed are those who proceed along the middle. The middle is the best. Spiritual Conditions the third question is, what are spiritual conditions? We have already stated that according to the Holy Koran, the fountainhead of spiritual conditions is the soul at rest, which carries a person from the grade of a moral being to the grade of a godly being. As Allah the Glorious has said, Ya ayatuhan nafsul mutmain Al-Fajr, O soul that has found its rest in God, return to thy Lord, Thou well pleased with him, and he well pleased with thee. So enter among my chosen servants, and enter my garden. Chapter 89, verses 28 to 31. It should be remembered that the highest spiritual condition of a person in this life is that he should find comfort in God, and all his satisfaction, and ecstasy, and delight should be centered in God. This is the condition which is called the heavenly life. In this condition, a person is bestowed the heavenly life in this very world in return for his perfect sincerity, purity, and faithfulness. Other people look forward to paradise in the hereafter, but he enters it in this very life. Arriving at this stage, a person realizes that the worship that was prescribed for him is in truth the food that nurtures his soul and on which his spiritual life largely depends and that its cons consummation is not postponed to the afterlife. All the reproof that the reproving self administers to him on his unclean life 
and yet fails to arouse fully his longing for virtue and to generate real disgust against his evil desires and to bestow full power of adherence to virtue is transformed by this urge which is the beginning of the development of the soul at rest. On arriving at this stage, a person becomes capable of achieving complete prosperity. All the passions of self begin to wither and a strengthening breeze begins to blow upon the soul so that the person concerned looks upon his previous weaknesses with remorse. At that time, nature and habits experience a complete transformation, and the person is drawn far away from his previous condition. He is washed and cleansed, and God inscribes love of virtue upon his heart and casts out from it the impurity of vice with his own hand, the forces of truth all enter the citadel of his heart, and righteousness occupies all the battlements of his nature, and truth becomes victorious, and falsehood lays down its arms and is put to flight. The hand of God is placed over his heart, and he takes every step under the shade of God. God Almighty has indicated all this in the following verses. أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيدهم بروح من المجادلة سيس حبب إليكم الإيمان وزينه في قلوبكم وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْإِسْيَانِ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ الحجرات آٹھ نو جا الحق وزا کل بات ان البات کانا زہو کا بنی اسرائیل بیاسی دیز آر دے ان ہوز ہارٹس اللہ ہیز انسکرائبڈ فیتھ وتھ ہیز اون ہینڈ اینڈ ہوم ہی ہیز ہیلپڈ وتھ دی ہولی اسپرٹ چیپٹر ففٹی ایٹ ورس ہیز انڈیئرڈ فیتھ ٹو یو and has made it to seem fair to your hearts, and he has made you averse to disbelief, wickedness, and disobedience, and impressed upon your hearts the viciousness of evil ways. All this has come about through the grace and favor of Allah. Allah is all-knowing wise. Chapter 49, verses 8 and 9. Truth has arrived, and falsehood has vanished. Falsehood is bound to disappear. 1782. All this pertains to the spiritual condition which a person attains at the third stage. No one can acquire true insight unless he arrives at this condition. God's inscribing faith on their hearts with his own hand and helping them with the Holy Spirit means that no one can achieve true purity and righteousness unless he receives heavenly help. At the stage of the reproving self, a person's condition is that he repents time after time and yet falls down and often despairs and considers his condition beyond remedy. He remains in this situation for a period and when the appointed time comes, a light during the day. With the descent of that light, he undergoes a wonderful change and he perceives the control of a hidden hand and beholds a wonderful world. At that time he realizes that God exists, and his eyes are filled with a light which they did not possess before. How shall we discover that path, and how shall we acquire that light? Be it known that in this world every effect has a cause, and behind every move there is a mover. For the acquisition of every type of knowledge there is appointed a way that is called the straight path. Nothing can be achieved in this world without conformity to the rules that nature has appointed in that behalf from the very beginning. 
The law of nature informs us that for the achievement of each purpose there is appointed a straight path and the purpose can be achieved only by following that path. For instance, if we are sitting in a dark room, the straight path for obtaining the light of the sun is for us to open the window that faces the sun. When we do that, the light of the sun instantly enters the room and illumines it. Thus it is obvious that for the acquisition of God's love and real grace, there must be some window and there must be an appointed method for the acquisition of pure spirituality. Then we should see the straight path that leads to spirituality as we seek a straight path for the achievement of all our other purposes. That method is not that we should seek to meet God only through the exercise of our reason and by following our self-appointed ways. The doors which can only be opened by His powerful hands will not yield to our logic and philosophy. We cannot find the ever-living and self-subsisting God through our own devices. The only straight path for the achievement of this purpose is that we should first devote our lives together with all our faculties to the cause of God Almighty and should then occupy ourselves with supplication for meeting Him and should thus find God through God Himself. An Excellent Prayer the most excellent prayer which instructs us concerning the time and occasion of supplication and depicts before us the picture of spiritual zeal is the one that God, the Beneficent, has taught us in the opening chapter of the Holy Koran. It is as follows. All worthiness of praise belongs to Allah alone, who is the creator and sustainer of all the worlds. Chapter 1, verse 2. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. He provides for us out of his mercy before any action proceeds from us, and after we have acted, he rewards our action out of his mercy. Chapter 1, verse 3. Malik Yom Din. He alone is the master of the day of judgment and has not committed that day to anyone else. Chapter 1, verse 4. Yaka Nabudu wa Yaka Nastain. O thou who dost comprehend all these attributes, we worship thee alone and seek thy help in all our affairs. Chapter 1, verse 5. The use of the plural pronoun in this context indicates that all our faculties are occupied in his worship and are prostrate at his threshold. Every person, by virtue of his inner faculties, is a multiple entity, and the prostration of all his faculties before God is the condition that is called Islam. <inaudible> Guide us along thy straight path and establish us firmly on it. Chapter 1, verse 6. The path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed thy bounties and favors. And not of those who have incurred thy wrath, nor of those who went astray and did not reach thee. Chapter 1, verse 7. Amen. These verses tell us that divine bounties and favors are bestowed only upon those who offer up their lives as a sacrifice in the cause of God, and devoting themselves wholly to it, and being occupied entirely with his pleasure, continue to supplicate so that they might be bestowed all the spiritual bounties that a human being can receive by way of nearness to God, meeting him and hearing his words. With this supplication they worship God through all their faculties, eschew sin, and remain prostrate at his threshold. They safeguard themselves against all vice and shun the ways of God's wrath. As they seek God with high resolve and perfect sincerity, they find Him and are given to drink their fill of their understanding of God. The true and perfect grace that conveys a person to the spiritual world depends upon steadfastness, by which is meant that degree of sincerity and faithfulness which cannot be shaken by any trial. It means a strong relationship with the divine, which a sword cannot cut asunder, and fire cannot consume, nor can any other calamity damage it. The death of dear ones or separation from them should not interfere with it, nor should fear of dishonor affect it, 
nor should a painful death move the heart away from it in the very least degree. Thus this door is very narrow, and this path is very hard. Alas, how difficult it is. This is indicated by Almighty God in the following verse. If your fathers and your sons and your brethren and your wives and your kinsfolk and the wealth that you have acquired and the trade, the dullness of which you apprehend, and the dwellings that you fancy are dearer to you than Allah and his messenger and striving in his cause, then wait until Allah declares his judgment. Allah guides not the disobedient people. Chapter 9, verse 24. This verse clearly shows that those people who put aside the will of God and give preference to their relatives and their properties whom they love better are evildoers in the estimation of God and that they would surely be ruined because they preferred something else to God. This is the third stage in which that person becomes godly. Such a person welcomes thousands of calamities for the sake of God and leans toward him with such sincerity and devotion as if he has no one related to him except God and all others have died. The truth is that till we submit ourselves to death, we cannot behold the living God. The day our physical life undergoes death is the day of the manifestation of God. We are blind till we become blind to the sight of all besides God. We are dead till we become like a corpse in the hand of God. It is only when we face God completely that we acquire the steadfastness that overcomes all passions of self, and that steadfastness brings about the death of the life that is devoted to selfish purposes. This is described in the verse, <laughs> This means that God requires that we should offer ourselves to be sacrificed in his cause. Chapter 2, verse 113. We shall achieve steadfastness when all our faculties and powers are devoted to his cause, and our life and our death are all for his sake, as he has said. <laughs> Proclaim, O Prophet, my prayer and my sacrifices and my living and my dying are all for the sake of Allah. Chapter 6, verse 163. When a person's love of God reaches a stage at which his living and his dying is not for his own sake but is entirely for God, then God, who has always loved those who love him, bestows his love upon him, and by the meeting of these two loves, a light is generated inside the person which the world cannot recognize or understand. Thousands of the righteous and the elect had to lay down their lives because the world did not recognize them. They were accounted selfish and deceitful, as the world could not see their bright countenances. As is said, they look at thee, but they do not see thee. 
chapter 7, verse 199. In short, from the day when that light is generated in a person, he ceases to be earthly and becomes heavenly. He who is the master of all beings speaks inside him and manifests the light of his Godhead and makes his heart, which is saturated with his love, his throne. As soon as such a one becomes a new person through his bright transformation, God becomes a new God for him and manifests new ways for him. It is not that God becomes another God or that those ways are different from his ways and yet they are distinct from his normal ways of which worldly philosophy is not aware. He becomes one of those who are referred to in the verse of the people there are those of high degree who dedicate themselves wholly to seeking the pleasure of Allah in return for their lives these are the people towards whom Allah is most compassionate chapter 2 verse 208 thus he who arrives at the stage of spiritual life becomes wholly devoted to the cause of Allah. In this verse, God Almighty sets forth that only such a one is delivered from all suffering who sells his life in the cause of Allah in return for his pleasure and proves his devotion by laying down his life. He considers that he has been brought into being for obedience to his Creator and for service of his fellow beings. He performs all the virtues which are related to every one of his faculties with such eagerness and sincerity as if he beholds his true beloved in the mirror of his obedience. His will is identified with the will of God and all his delight is centered in his obedience to God. Righteous conduct proceeds from him not as labor but as delight and pleasure. This is the paradise that is bestowed upon a spiritual person in this very life. The paradise that will be bestowed in the hereafter would be a reflection of this paradise which will, through divine power, be manifested physically. This is referred to in the following verses. <laughs> For him who fears to stand before his Lord and is in awe of his greatness and majesty, there are two gardens, one in this world and the other in the hereafter. Chapter 55, verse 47. Those who are wholly devoted to God will be given a drink that will purify their hearts and their thoughts and their designs. Seventy-six, twenty-two. The virtuous shall be given a drink which is tempered with camphor, 
from a spring wherefrom the servants of Allah drink, they cause it to gush forth through their own efforts. 76 verses 6 and 7. The meaning of drinks prepared from camphor and ginger. We have already explained that the word kafor has been used in this verse for this reason that the Arabic word kafara means suppression and covering up. This is an indication that these people have quaffed the cup of cutting asunder from the world and turning to God with such sincerity that their love of the world has become quite cold. It is well known that all passions originate in the heart, and when the heart withdraws altogether from all undesirable fancies and never reverts to them at all, those passions begin to decline till they disappear altogether. That is what is conveyed in this verse. That is to say that such people draw far away from the passions of self and incline so completely towards God that their hearts become cold to worldly pursuits and their passions are suppressed as camphor suppresses poisonous matter. Then it is said, They will be given to drink therein of a cup tempered with ginger. Chapter 76, verses 18 and 19. The Arabic word for ginger Zanjabil is a compound of Zana and Jabal. Zana in Arabic idiom means ascending, and Jabal means a mountain. Thus, Zana Jabal means he ascends the mountain. It should be remembered that after a person recovers from a poisonous disease, he passes through two stages before he is restored to full health and strength. The first stage is when the poisonous matter is completely overcome and dangerous tendencies are reformed and poisonous conditions are safely averted and the attack of the fatal upsurge is completely suppressed. But the limbs are still weak, strength is lacking, and the patient treads warily. The second stage is when the patient is restored to full health and his body achieves full strength and he feels that he can climb hills and run along the heights. This condition is achieved in the third stage concerning which God Almighty has said that godly people of the highest rank drink of cups that are flavored with ginger. That is to say that arriving at the full strength of their spiritual condition, they can climb high mountains, meaning that they carry out great projects and make great sacrifices in the cause of God. The effect of ginger. It should be remembered that one of the qualities of ginger is that it strengthens the system and relieves dysentery and warms it up so that a person becomes capable, as it were, of climbing a mountain. By placing camphor and ginger in juxtaposition, it is intended to convey that when a person moves from a condition of subordination to his passions towards virtue, the first reaction is that the poisonous matters from which he suffers are suppressed and the surge of passions begins to subside as camphor suppresses poisonous matters. That is why it is found useful in the treatment of cholera and typhoid. When poisonous matters are completely suppressed and the patient recovers his health to a degree in which he still feels weak, the second stage is that he derives strength from a drink flavored with ginger. In spiritual terms, this drink is the manifestation of divine beauty, which is the nourishment of the soul. When he derives strength from this manifestation, he is enabled to climb high mountains, that is to say, he performs such surprisingly difficult feats in the cause of God that no one whose heart is not inspired by the warmth of love can perform. In these verses, God Almighty has employed two Arabic terms to illustrate these two conditions. One term is camphor, which means suppression, and the other is ginger, which means climbing. These are the two conditions which are encountered by seekers after God. <laughs> We have prepared chains and collars and a blazing fire for the disbelievers. Chapter 76, verse 5. This means that for those who reject the truth and have no inclination toward accepting it, God has prepared chains and collars and a blazing fire. 
The meaning is that those who do not seek God with a true heart suffer a severe reaction. They are so much involved with the world as if their feet are secured by chains, and they bend down so much towards worldly pursuits as if there are collars round their necks which do not permit them to lift their eyes towards heaven. They have a burning desire for the things of the world, property, authority, domination, wealth, etc. As God Almighty finds them unworthy and committed to undesirable pursuits, he inflicts them with these three sufferings. This is an indication that every human action is followed by a corresponding action on the part of God. For instance, when a person closes all the doors and windows of his room, his action is followed by a divine action whereby the room becomes dark. All the inevitable consequences of our actions that have been appointed by God Almighty under the law of nature are all God's actions, inasmuch as he is the cause of causes. For instance, if a person swallows poison, his action would be followed by the divine action that he would suffer death. In the same way, if a person acts in some improper way which attracts an infectious disease, his action would be followed by the divine action that he would be afflicted with that disease. Thus, as we observe clearly that in our worldly life there is an inevitable result for every action of ours, and that every result is the act of God Almighty, the same law operates in religious matters also. For instance, it is said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدَيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا أَلَنْ كَبُوتْ سَتَّرْ فَلَمَّا زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ أَسَّفْ چھے this means that in consequence of the full striving of a person in seeking God, the inevitable act of God is to guide him along the ways that lead to him. Chapter 29, verse 70. As a contrast, it is said, when they deviated from the right course and did not desire to tread along the straight path, the divine action followed in that their hearts were made perverse. Chapter 61, verse 6. To illustrate this even more clearly, it is said, Man kana fi hazihi ama, fa huwa fil akhirati ama, wa dallu sabila. Bani Israel, tehattar. He who remains blind in this life will be blind in the hereafter also, and even more astray. Chapter 17, verse 73. This is an indication that the virtuous see God in this very life, and they behold their true beloved in this world. The purport of this verse is that the foundation of the heavenly life is laid in this very world and that the root of hellish blindness is also the vile and blind life of this world. Then it is said, <laughs> Give glad tidings to those who believe and work righteousness that for them there are gardens beneath which rivers flow. Chapter 2, verse 26. In this verse, God Almighty has described faith as a garden beneath which rivers flow and has thus indicated that faith is related to righteous action as a garden is related to the water of the river or stream. As a garden cannot flourish without water, faith cannot survive without righteous action. If there is faith but no righteous action, the faith is vain, and if there are actions but not faith, the actions are mere show or display. The reality of the Islamic paradise is that it is a reflection of the faith and actions of a person in this life and is not something that will be bestowed upon a person from outside. A person's paradise is developed inside him and everyone's paradise is his faith and his righteous actions, the delight of which begins to be tasted in this very life and one perceives the hidden gardens and streams of faith and righteous action 
which will become concretely manifest in the hereafter. God's holy teaching instructs us that pure and perfect and firm faith in God, his attributes and his designs, is a beautiful garden of fruit trees and righteous actions are the streams that irrigate the garden. The Holy Koran says, Ibrahim, this means that a word of faith which is free from every extreme and defect and falsehood and vanity and is perfect in every way is like a tree which is free from every defect. The root of that tree is firm in the earth, and its branches spread into heaven. It brings forth its fruit at all times, and at no time are its branches without fruit. Chapter 14, verses 25 and 6. Thus it will be seen that God Almighty has described a word of faith as a tree that bears fruit at all times, and has set forth three of its characteristics. The first is that its root, that is to say its true meaning, should be firm in the earth, meaning that its truth and reality should be acceptable to human nature and conscience. Its second characteristic is that its branches should spread out into heaven, meaning that it should be supported by reason and should be in accord with the heavenly law of nature, which is the work of God. In other words, the law of nature should furnish arguments in support of its correctness and truth, and those arguments should be beyond the reach of criticism. Its third characteristic should be that its fruit should be permanent and unlimited. That is to say, the blessings and effects of acting upon it should continue to be manifested at all times and should not cease to be manifested after a period. Then it is said, <laughs> Ibrahim, the case of an evil word is like that of an evil tree which is uprooted from the earth and has no stability. Chapter 14, verse 27, meaning that human nature rejects it and it cannot be established by reason or the law of nature or human conscience. It has no more stability than an idle tale. As the Holy Koran has said that the trees of true faith will appear in the hereafter as grapes and pomegranates and other good fruits, in the same way the evil tree of faithlessness is called zakhkum, as is said. Are the gardens of paradise better entertainment or the tree Zakum, which we have made a means of trial for the wrongdoers? It is a tree that springs forth from the root of hell, that is to say, it grows out of arrogance and self-esteem. Its fruit is, as it were, the heads of Satan, meaning that he who eats it would be ruined. 
chapter 37, verses 63 to 66. Then it is said, The tree of Zakum is the, fru is the food of the deliberately sinful. It will boil in their bellies like molten copper. Chapter 44, verses 44 to 47. The sinful one will be commanded, Now suffer this, thou who didst hold thyself mighty and noble. 44, 51. This is a wrathful expression, meaning that if he had not been arrogant and had not turned away from the truth out of pride and a false notion of his dignity, he would not have had to suffer in this fashion. This verse indicates that the word zakum is compounded of zuk, meaning taste it, and am, which is formed by the first and last letters of the remaining portion of the verse. Inna kantal azizul karim. Thus God Almighty has described the words of faith uttered in this life as the trees of paradise. In the same way, he has described the words of faithlessness uttered in this life as the tree of hell, which he has called zakum, and has thus indicated that the root of paradise and of hell is laid in this very life. At another place, hell is described as Meaning that hell is a fire, the source of which is the wrath of God, and which is kindled by sin and overcomes the heart. Chapter 104, verses 7 and 8. This is an indication that at the root of this fire are the sorrows and griefs and torments which afflict the heart. All spiritual torments arise in the heart and then envelop the whole body. At another place it is said, meaning that the fuel of the fire of hell which keeps it blazing is of two types. One, those men who turn away from God and worship other things, or who require their own worship, as is said, Meaning that false deities and their worshippers will all be thrown into hell. The second type of fuel of hell is the idols. If there had been no false gods and no idols, nor any worshippers of these, there would have been no hell. Chapter 2, verse 25, and chapter 21, verse 99. All these verses show that in the holy word of God, heaven and hell are not like the physical world. Their source is spiritual, although it is true that in the hereafter they will take on concrete forms, and yet they will not belong to this world means of establishing perfect spiritual relationship with God. The method of establishing perfect spiritual relationship with God that the Holy Koran teaches us is Islam, meaning devoting one's whole life to the cause of God and being occupied with the supplications which we have been taught in Surah Fatiha. This is the essence of Islam, Complete surrender to God and the supplication taught in Surah Fatiha are the only methods of meeting God and drinking the water of true salvation. This is the only method that the law of nature has appointed for man's highest exaltation and for his meeting the divine. Those alone find God who enter into the spiritual fire of Islam and continue occupied with the supplication set out in Surah Fatiha. Islam is the blazing fire that burns up our life and consuming our false deities presents the sacrifice of our life and our property and our honor to our holy God. Entering it, we drink the water of a new life and all our spiritual faculties establish such a relationship with God as subsists between kindred. A fire leaps up from our inside like lightning and another fire descends upon us from above. By the meeting of these two flames, all our passions and our love for anything beside God are totally consumed and we become dead vis-à-vis -vis our previous life. This condition is named Islam in the Holy Koran. 
Through our complete surrender to the will of God, our passions are killed, and through supplication we acquire new life. This second life is signalized by the receipt of revelation. Arriving at this stage is interpreted as meeting with God, in other words, beholding God. At this stage, a person establishes a relationship with God by virtue of which he becomes as if he were beholding God, and he is invested with power, and all his senses and his inner faculties are illumined, and he feels the strong pull of a holy life. At this stage, God becomes his eye with which he sees, and becomes his tongue with which he speaks, and becomes his hand with which he assaults his enemy, and becomes his ear with which he hears, and becomes his feet with which he walks. This stage is referred to in the verse... Allah's hand is above their hands, chapter 48-11. In the same way it is said, it was not thou who didst throw, but it was Allah who threw. Chapter 8, verse 18. In short, at this stage, there is perfect union with God, and his holy will pervades the soul thoroughly, and the moral power that had previously been weak becomes firm like a mountain, and reason and intelligence are sharpened to the extreme. This is the meaning of the verse. <laughs> He has strengthened them with his spirit. Chapter 58, verse 23. At this stage, the streams of love for and devotion to him surge up in such manner that to die in the cause of God and to endure thousands of torments for his sake and to become disgraced in his path become as easy as breaking a small straw. One is pulled towards God without knowing who is pulling. One is carried about by a hidden hand, and to do God's will becomes the purpose of one's life. At this stage, God appears very close, as he has said, <laughs> We are closer to him than his jugular vein. Chapter 50, verse 17. In that condition, the lower relationship of a person falls away from him, as ripe fruit falls away automatically from the branch of a tree. His relationship with God deepens, and he draws far away from all creation, and is honored with the word and converse of God. The doors of access to this stage are as wide open today as they were at any time, and divine grace still bestows this bounty upon those who seek it as he did before. But this is not achieved by the mere exercise of the tongue, and this door is not opened by vain talk and boasts. There are many who seek, but there are few who find. Why is that so? It is because this stage demands true earnestness and true sacrifice. Mere words mean nothing in this context. To step faithfully onto the fire from which other people run away is the first requirement of this path. Boasts avail nothing. What is needed is practical zeal and earnestness. In this context, God the Glorious has said, <laughs> When my servants inquire from thee concerning me, tell them I am close. I respond to the call of the supplicant when he calls on me. So should they seek me through their supplications and have firm faith in me that they may be rightly guided. Chapter 2, verse 187.
Second question. What is the state of man after death? The state of man after death is not a new state, only his condition in this life is made manifest more clearly in the next life. Whatever is the true condition of a person with respect to his beliefs and actions, righteous or otherwise, in this life, remains hidden inside him, and its poison, or its antidote, affects his being covertly. In the life after death it will not be so. Everything will manifest itself openly. One experiences a specimen of it in a dream. The prevailing condition of the body of the sleeper makes itself manifest in his dream. When he is heading towards high fever, he is apt to see fire and flames in his dream, and if he is sickening due to influenza or a severe cold, he is apt to find himself floating about in water. Thus, whatever the body is heading for becomes visible in a dream. So, one can understand that the same is the way of God with regard to the afterlife. As a dream transmutes our spiritual condition into a physical form, the same will happen in the next life. Our actions and their consequences will be manifested physically in the next life, and whatever we carry hidden within us from this life will all be displayed openly on our countenances in the next life. As a person observes diverse types of uh, manifestations in his dreams, but is not conscious that they are only manifestations and deems them as realities, the same will happen in the next life. Through such manifestations, God will display a new power, a power which is perfect, complete, and absolute, as he is all-powerful. If we were not to call the conditions of the next life manifestations and were to say that they would be a new creation by divine power, that would be perfectly correct. God has said, <laughs> No virtuous one knows what bliss is kept hidden from him as a reward for that which he used to do. Chapter 32, verse 18. Thus, God has described all those bounties as hidden, the like of which is not to be found in this world. It is obvious that the bounties of this world are not hidden from us, and we are familiar with milk, pomegranates, and grapes, etc., which we eat here. This shows that the bounties of the next life are something else and have nothing in common with the bounties of this life except the name. He who conceives of the conditions of paradise in the terms of the conditions of this life has not the least understanding of the Holy Koran. In interpreting the verse that we have just cited, our Lord and Master, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said that heaven and its bounties are such as no eye has seen, nor has any ear heard, nor have they been conceived by the mind of man. Whereas we see that the bounties of this world, and hear of them, and their thought, also passes through our minds. Now, when God and his messenger describe them as something strange, we would depart altogether from the Holy Koran if we were to imagine that in heaven we shall be given the same milk which is obtained in this life from cows and buffaloes, as if herds of milk cattle would be kept in heaven, and there will be numerous beehives in the trees of heaven from which angels will procure honey and pour it into streams. Have these concepts any relationship with the teaching that says that those bounties have never been witnessed in this world? and that they illumine the souls and foster our understanding of God and provide spiritual nourishment. They are described in physical terms, but we are told that their source is the soul and its righteousness. Let no one imagine that the verse of the Holy Koran cited below indicates that the dwellers of paradise, on observing these bounties, will recognize them, that they had been bestowed these bounties aforetime, also, as Allah the Glorious has said, Allah 
Give glad tidings to those who believe and work perfect righteousness that they will inherit gardens beneath which rivers flow. Whenever they are provided with fruits therefrom, which they will have already tasted in the life of the world, they will exclaim, This is what we were given before, because they will find that those fruits resemble the fruits which they have already tasted. Chapter 2, verse 26. It is not to be supposed from the wording of this verse that on beholding the bounties of paradise, the dwellers of paradise will discover that they are the same bounties which had been bestowed upon them in their previous life. This would be a great mistake and would be contrary to the true meaning of the verse. What God Almighty has said here is that those who believe and work righteousness build a paradise with their own hands, the trees of which are their faith and the streams of which are their righteous actions. In the hereafter also they will eat of the fruits of this paradise, only those fruits will be sweeter and more manifest. As they will have eaten those fruits spiritually in this world, they will recognize them in the other world and will exclaim, These appear to be the same fruits that we have already eaten, and they will find that those fruits resemble the fruits that they had eaten before in this world. This verse clearly proclaims that those people who were nurtured in this life on the love of God will be given the same nurture in physical shape in the hereafter. As they will have tasted the delight of love already in this life and would be aware of it, their souls would recall the time when they used to remember their true beloved in corners, in solitude, and in the darkness of night, and used to experience its delight. In short, there is no mention in this verse of material food. If it should strike anyone that as the righteous would have been given this spiritual nourishment in their life in this world, it could not be said that it was a bounty that no one had seen or heard of in the world, nor had it been conceived by the mind of man. The answer would be that there is no contradiction here, as this verse does not mean that the dwellers of paradise would be bestowed the bounties of this world. Whatever they are bestowed by way of comprehension of the divine are the bounties of the hereafter, a specimen of which is given to them in advance to stimulate their eagerness. It should be remembered that a godly person does not belong to the world. That is why the world hates him. He belongs to heaven and is bestowed heavenly bounties. A man of the world is given worldly bounties and a man of heaven is bestowed heavenly bounties. Thus it is true that those bounties are hidden from the ears and hearts and eyes of the worldly. But he whose worldly life suffers death and who is given a drink of the spiritual cup, which he will drink in a physical form in the hereafter, will then recall having partaken of it in his previous life. It is true, however, that he will consider the eyes and ears of the world as unaware of it. As he was in the world, though he was not of the world, he will also testify that the bounties of heaven are not of the world, and that he did not see such a bounty in the world, nor did his ear hear of it, nor did his mind conceive it. He saw a specimen of those bounties of the hereafter which were not of this world. They were a presage of the world to come to which he was related and had no connection with the life of this world. Three Quranic Insights Concerning the Hereafter It should be kept in mind that the Holy Quran has set forth three insights with regard to the conditions of the life after death which we now proceed to expound. First Insight The Holy Quran has repeatedly affirmed that the life after death is not a new phenomenon and all its manifestations are reflections of this life. For instance, it is said, 
وكل إنسان ملزمناه طائره في عنقه ونخرج له يوم القيامة كتابا يلقاه منشورا بني إسرائيل صدى Every person's deeds have we fastened firmly to his neck, and on the day of judgment we shall make them manifest, and shall place them before him in the form of a book which he will find wide open. Chapter 17, verse 14. In this verse the expression bird has been metaphorically employed for actions, because every action, good or bad, flies away like a bird, as soon as it is performed, and its labor or enjoyment comes to an end. Only its heavy or light impress is left on the heart. The Koran sets forth the principle that every human action leaves its hidden impress upon its author and attracts an appropriate divine reaction which preserves the evil or the virtue of that action. Its impress is inscribed on the heart and face and eyes and ears and hands and feet of its performer. This is the hidden record which will become manifest in the hereafter. Concerning the dwellers of heaven, it is said, on that day thou wilt see the light of the believing men and the believing women, which is hidden in this world, running before them and on their right hands manifestly. Chapter 57, verse 13. At another place, addressing the wrongdoers, it is said, <laughs> The desire of increase in worldly possessions beguiles you till you reach the graves. Do not set your hearts upon the world. You will soon come to know the vanity of your pursuits. Again, you will soon come to know how mistaken you are in pursuing the world. If you had possessed the certainty of knowledge, you would surely see hell in this very life. But you will see it with the certainty of sight in your middle state, Barzach. Then you shall be called to account on the day of judgment, and the torment will be imposed on you, and you will know hell through your experience. Chapter 102, verses 2 to 9. Three Types of Knowledge in these verses, God Almighty has clearly set forth that for the wicked the life of hell begins in a covert way in this very world, and if they would reflect, they would observe hell in this very life. Here God Almighty has indicated three types of knowledge, namely, knowledge by certainty of reason, knowledge by certainty of sight, and knowledge by certainty of experience. This might be illustrated thus. When a person perceives smoke from a distance, his mind conceives that smoke and fire are inseparable, and therefore where there is smoke, there must be fire also. This would be knowledge by the certainty of reason. Then on a nearer approach, he sees the flames of the fire, and that is knowledge by the certainty of sight. Should he enter into the fire, that would be knowledge by the certainty of experience. In these verses, God Almighty says that knowledge of the existence of hell as a certainty can be acquired in this life through reason. Its knowledge through the certainty of sight will be acquired in Barzakh, the intermediate state between death and judgment, 
And on the day of judgment, that knowledge would become a certainty by experience. Three conditions. It might be explained at this stage that according to the Holy Koran, there are three states of existence. The first is the world, which is called the first creation, and is the state of effort. In this world, man works good or evil. After resurrection, the virtuous will continue their advance in goodness, but that would be by the sheer grace of God and would not be the result of any effort of man. The second is the intermediate state, which is called barzukh. In Arabic idiom, barzukh is something which is situated between two other things. As that state will be between the first creation and the resurrection, it is called barzukh. This expression has always been employed for the intermediate state. Thus, it comprehends a great hidden testimony in support of the existence of the intermediate state. I have established in my book, Minamur Rahman, that the words of Arabic have issued from the mouth of God, and that this is the only language which is the language of the Most Holy God and is the most ancient tongue and is the fountainhead of all types of knowledge, and is the mother of all languages, and is the first and last throne of divine revelation. It is the first throne of divine revelation because Arabic was the language of God that was with God since the beginning. Then that language came down to the world, and people converted it into their respective languages. It is the last throne of divine revelation, inasmuch as the last book of God, which is the Holy Koran, was revealed in Arabic. Barzukh is an Arabic word which is compounded of bara and zakha, which means that the manner of earning through action has ended and has fallen into a hidden state. Barzukh is a state in which the mortal condition of man is dissolved and the soul and the body are separated. The body is buried in a pit, and the soul also falls into a sort of pit, which is indicated by the expression zakha, because it is no longer able to earn good or evil, which it could only do through its relationship with the body. It is obvious that the health of the soul is dependent upon the health of the body. An injury inflicted upon one part of a person's brain causes loss of memory, and an injury occasioned to another part destroys the faculty of reflection and brings about unconsciousness. Similarly, a convulsion of the brain muscle, or a swelling, or a hemorrhage, or morbidity, may, by causing obstruction, lead to insensibility, epilepsy, or cerebral apoplexy. Thus, our experience teaches us definitely that the soul, divorced from the body, is utterly useless. It is entirely vain to imagine that our soul, without its body, can enjoy any kind of bliss. We might entertain such a fancy, but reason lends it no support. We cannot conceive that our soul, which is rendered helpless by minor upsets of the body, could continue in a perfect condition when its relationship with the body comes to an end altogether. Does not our daily experience teach us that the health of the body is essential for the health of the soul? When one of us reaches extreme old age, his soul also falls into dotage. Its store of knowledge is stolen by old age, as is said by God the Glorious, that... <laughs> In old age, a person arrives at a stage in which, after having acquired much knowledge, he loses it all. Chapter 26, verse uh, 6. All this observation of ours is proof enough that the soul without the body amounts to nothing. This is reinforced by the thought that if the soul without the body had amounted to anything, it would have been without purpose for God Almighty to set up a relationship between it and a mortal body. Further, it is worthy of note that God Almighty has created man for limitless progress. Then, if the soul is not able to achieve the progress possible in this brief life without the companionship of the body, how can we expect that it would be able by itself, without the companionship of the body, 
to achieve limitless progress in the hereafter. All this shows that according to Islamic principles, for the soul to act perfectly, it is necessary for it to enjoy the companionship of a body at all times. On death, the soul departs from this mortal body, but in the intermediate state, every soul is invested with a body in order to enable it to react to the conditions of that state. That body is not like this physical body, but is prepared from light or from darkness, according to the quality of the person's actions in this life, as if a man's actions serve as a body for the soul in that state. In the word of God, it is repeatedly mentioned that some bodies will be bright and some will be dark. They will be prepared from the light or from the darkness of human actions. This is a fine mystery, but is not opposed to reason. A perfect human being can enjoy an illumined body in this very life, and there are many instances of this which are experienced in a state of vision. This may be difficult of comprehension by a person of average intelligence, but those who have some experience of the state of vision will not regard such a body as is prepared from human actions as a matter of surprise and improbability, but will duly appreciate this phenomenon. In short, this body, which is acquired according to the condition of one's actions, becomes a source of the recompense of good and evil in the intermediate state. I have experience of this. I have often had experience in a complete state of wakefulness of meeting some persons who had died, and I saw that the bodies of some evildoers and misguided ones were so dark as if they had been made of smoke. In short, I am personally acquainted with these matters, and I affirm emphatically that, as God Almighty has said, everyone is invested with a body after death which is either bright or dark. It would be a mistake on the part of man to seek to establish these fine insights through the mere exercise of reason. It should be realized that as the eye cannot discover the taste of something sweet, nor can the tongue behold anything, in the same way the knowledge of the life after death, which can only be acquired through holy visions, cannot be explained fully on the basis of reason. God Almighty has appointed diverse means for acquiring knowledge in this world of that which is unknown. Therefore, it is necessary to seek everything through its proper means. It is only then that it can be discovered. Another matter that must be kept in mind is that in his word, God has described as dead those people who are involved in vice and error and has declared the virtuous as alive. The reason for this is that the functions of the lives of those who die in a state of neglect of God, for instance, eating and drinking and indulgence of their passions are cut off, and they have no share of spiritual sustenance. They are truly dead and will be revived only for punishment. As God, the Glorious, has said, <laughs> The portion of him who comes to his Lord a sinner is hell. He shall neither die therein nor live. Chapter 20, verse 75. But those whom God loves do not die with their physical death, for their sustenance is with them. After Barzuch, there is the third state of resurrection. In that state, every soul, good or bad, righteous or disobedient, will be bestowed a visible body. That day has been appointed for the perfect manifestations of God, when every person will get to know the being of his Lord fully, and everyone will arrive at the climax of his recompense. This should not be a matter for surprise, for God has every power and does whatever he wills, as he has said,
Does not man know that we have created him from a mere sperm drop injected into the womb? Then he becomes a persistent disputer. He forgets the process of his own creation, but has a lot to say concerning us. He asks, how shall a person be revived when even his bones have decayed? Who has the power to revive him? Tell them, he who created them the first time will revive them. He knows well every type of creation. Chapter 36, verses 78 to 80. His power is such that when he determines upon a thing, he says concerning it, Be, and it is. Thus holy is he, in whose hand is the kingdom over all things. To him will you all be brought back. Chapter 36, verses 82 to 84. In these verses, God the Glorious has set forth that nothing is beyond his power. Has he who created a man from a lowly drop not the power to create him a second time? An ignorant person might object that as the third state, which is the state of resurrection, would arrive after a long period, the state of Barzuch would only be a sort of lock-up for the good and the bad, and this would be purposeless. The answer is that this is a misunderstanding which is due to lack of knowledge. In the book of God, there are two states mentioned for the recompense of the good and the bad, one of which is the state of Barzuch, in which everyone will receive his recompense in a covert manner. The wicked would enter hell immediately on death, and the virtuous will find comfort in heaven immediately after death. There are several verses in the Holy Koran to the effect that every person will, immediately on his death, encounter the recompense of his actions. For instance, it is said concerning a righteous one, His Lord said to him, Enter thou into paradise. Chapter 36, verse 27. And concerning a wicked one, it is said, this has reference to two friends, one of whom was admitted to heaven and the other was condemned to hell. The one who was admitted to heaven was anxious to find out where his friend was. He was shown that his friend was in the midst of hell. Chapter 37, verse 56. Thus reward and punishment start immediately and those condemned to hell go to hell and those who are to be admitted to heaven go to heaven. But thereafter there is a day of grand manifestation which has been appointed out of the great wisdom of God. He created man so that he should be recognized through his power of creation. Then he will destroy everything so that he might be recognized through his supremacy over everything. And then he will gather everyone after bestowing perfect life on them so that he might be recognized through his power. Second Insight the second insight concerning the life after death which the Holy Koran has set forth is that in the hereafter all the spiritual conditions of this world will be manifested physically both in the intermediate state and in the resurrection. In this context one verse is 
ومن كان في هذه اما وهو في الاخره اما وذل سبيلا بني اسرائيل تحتر he who continues blind in this life will be blind in the hereafter and even more astray chapter 17 verse 73 This means that the spiritual blindness of this life will be manifested and felt physically in the hereafter. In another verse it is said, Seize this hellish one and put a collar round his neck and burn him in hell and bind him in a chain the length of which is 70 cubits. Chapter 69 verses 31 to 33. These verses show that the spiritual torment of this world will be manifested physically in the hereafter. For instance, the collar of worldly ambition which had bent his head towards the earth will become physically perceptible in the life after death. Similarly, the chain of worldly preoccupations will become visible round his feet and the fire of worldly desires will appear in full blaze. A vicious person conceals a whole hell of worldly greed and desires inside himself and perceives the burning sensation of this hell at the time of his failures and frustrations so when he is cast away from his mortal desires and becomes subject to eternal despair god almighty will cause his sorrow to be manifested physically in the shape of fire as is said وَحِيلَ بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ مَا يَشْتَهُونَ كَمَا فُعِلَ بِأَشْيَائِهِمْ سَبَا حَجْبَتْ A barrier will be placed between them and that which they yearn after and that will be the root of their torment. Chapter 34 verse 55 The chain of 70 cubits is an indication that a wicked one often attains the age of 70 years and sometimes leaving aside his years of childhood and extreme old age he is granted a period of 70 years which he could employ for work wisely and with good sense but an unfortunate one spends these 70 years caught in the coil of worldly preoccupations and does not desire to be free of them Thus God Almighty affirms in this verse that the 70 years that such a one spends in worldly pursuits will be manifested as a chain of 70 cubits in the hereafter one cubit for each year it must be kept in mind in this connection that God Almighty does not afflict any creature of his with a misfortune from himself he merely confronts a person with his own evil deeds at another place he has said O ye vile and errant ones proceed towards a shelter which has three branches neither affording shade nor protecting from the blaze chapter 77 verses 31 and 32 the three branches mentioned here represent bestiality savageness and wild imagination in the case of those who do not regulate these faculties and thus convert them into moral qualities they will manifest themselves in the hereafter as three branches of a tree which are bare of leaves and can afford no shade or protection against fire so that such people would be consumed by the fire as a contrast god almighty has said concerning the dwellers of heaven yawma taral mu'minin 
நவல் மோமினாசானூரும் வினீஹிம் On that day thou wilt see the light of the believing men and believing women, which is kept hidden in this world, running before them and on their right hands. Chapter 57, verse 13. And in another verse it is said, Yom atab yadro vujuhum vataswadro vujuhum On that day, some faces will be bright and others will be dark. 3, 107. A third verse sets out, The garden promised to the righteous is as if it has rivers of water that corrupt not, and rivers of milk of which the taste changes not, and rivers of wine which do not inebriate, a delight for those who drink, and rivers of pure honey which has no impurity. Chapter 47, verse 16. It is clearly stated here that heaven should be understood as metaphorically comprising inexhaustible streams of these bounties. This means that the water of life which a person of spiritual understanding drinks in this life will be manifested visibly in the hereafter. The spiritual milk by which he is sustained like a suckling in this life will become physically visible in heaven. The, the wine of God's love which inebriated him all the time spiritually in this life will be manifested in the shape of rivers in heaven. The honey of the sweetness of faith which a person possessing spiritual understanding swallowed spiritually in this world will be manifested and felt physically in heaven. Every dweller of heaven will proclaim his spiritual condition openly through his gardens and rivers. God will unveil himself on that day for the dwellers of heaven. In short, spiritual conditions will not remain hidden in the hereafter but will be physically visible and perceptible. Third insight. The third insight concerning the hereafter is that there will be unlimited progress therein. As God Almighty has said, The light of the believers will run before them, and on their right hands they will supplicate, Lord, Perfect our light for us, and cover us with thy grace. Surely thou hast power over all things. Chapter 66, verse 9. Their supplication that their light might be perfected is an indication of limitless progress. It means that when they have arrived at one stage of illumination, they will perceive a higher stage ahead of them, and viewing it, they will consider the stage in which they are, as being inferior and will supplicate for the attainment of the higher stage, and when they arrive at that stage, they will perceive a still higher third stage ahead of them, and they will supplicate for its achievement. Thus their yearning for constant progress is indicated by the expression, Do thou perfect our light. In short, this chain of progress will continue indefinitely. 
There will be no falling away, nor will they be expelled from heaven, but will ad daily advance further forward. It may be asked that as they will have entered heaven and all their sins would have been forgiven, then what further need would there be for supplicating for forgiveness? The answer is that the true meaning of maghfirat, seeking forgiveness, is to suppress and cover up an imperfect or defective condition. Thus the dwellers of heaven will seek the attainment of perfection and their complete absorption in light. Observing a higher condition, they will consider their condition defective and would desire its suppression. And then, observing a still higher condition, they would desire that their lower condition should be covered up, and thus they will continuously seek unlimited maghfirat. This seeking of maghfirat or istighfar is sometimes made the basis of adverse criticism of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. I trust that now it will have become clear that the desire for maghfirat is a matter of pride for man. He who is born of woman and does not make istighfar his habit is a worm and not man. He is blind and not seeing. He is unclean and not pure. In short, according to the Holy Koran, hell and heaven are both reflections of a man's life and are not something new that comes from outside. It is true that in the hereafter they will be manifested physically, but they will be reflections of the spiritual conditions of man in this life. We do not conceive of heaven as containing material trees, nor of hell as full of brimstone and sulfur. According to Islamic teachings, heaven and hell are the reflections of the actions that a person carries out in this world. Third question. The object of man's life and the means of its attainment. Different people, being short-sighted and lacking high resolve, appoint different purposes for their lives and limit themselves to worldly goals and ambitions. But the purpose that God Almighty has appointed for man in His Holy Word is as follows. <laughs> I have created man and jinn so that they may know me and worship me. Chapter 51, verse 57. Thus the true purpose of man's life is the worship of God, his understanding and complete devotion to him. It is obvious that man is not in a position to appoint the purpose of his own life, for he does not come into the world of his own accord, nor will he depart therefrom, therefrom of his own will. He is a creature, and the one who created him and invested him with better and higher faculties than those of all other animals has also appointed a purpose for his life. Whether anyone penetrates to it or not, the purpose of man's creation, without a doubt, is the worship and the understanding of God and complete devotion to Him. At another place, God Almighty has said in the Holy Quran, <laughs> The religion which provides true understanding of God and prescribes his true worship is Islam. Chapter 3, verse 20. Islam is inherent in man's nature, and man has been created in accord with Islam. That is the everlasting faith. Chapter 30, verses 30 and 31. This means that God has desired that man should devote himself to his worship and obedience and love with all his faculties. That is why he has bestowed on man all the faculties that are appropriate for Islam. 
These verses have very wide meaning, a part of which we have set out in the third part of the answer to the first question. Here we wish to state briefly that the true purpose of the internal and external limbs and faculties that have been bestowed on man is the understanding of God and his worship and his love. That is why, despite occupying himself with diverse projects in this life, man does not find his true welfare except in God. Having had great wealth, having held high office, having become a great merchant, having ruled a great kingdom, having been known as a great philosopher, in the end he departs from all these involvements with great regret. His heart constantly rebukes him on his total preoccupation with worldly affairs, and his conscience never approves his cunning and deceit and illicit activities. An intelligent person can appreciate this problem in this way also, that the purpose of everything is to be determined by its highest performance beyond which its faculties cannot operate. For instance, the highest function of a bullock is plowing or irrigation or transportation. Its faculties are not adapted to anything else. Therefore, the purpose of a bullock's life are just three things. It has no power to do anything else. But when we look into the faculties of man and try to discover what is their highest reach, we find that he seeks after God the exalted. He desires to become so devoted to God that he should keep nothing as his own and all that is his should become God's. He shares with the other animals his natural urge towards eating, sleeping, etc. In industry, some animals are far ahead of him. Indeed, the bees extricating the essence of different types of flowers produce such excellent honey that man has not yet been able to match them. It is obvious, therefore, that the highest reach of man's faculties is to meet God the exalted. Thus, the true purpose of his life is that the window of his heart should open toward God. Means of the Attainment of Man's Purpose It may be asked, how can this purpose be achieved? and through what means can a person find God. The very first means of achieving this goal is to recognize God Almighty correctly and to believe in the true God. For if the very first step is not right, for instance, if a person believes in a bird or an animal or in the elements or in the issue of a human being as God, there can be no hope of his treading along the straight path in his further progress towards God. The true God helps his seekers, but how can a dead God help the dead? In this context, God the Glorious has set forth an excellent illustration. <laughs> Unto him alone is the true prayer as he has the power to do all things. Those on whom they call beside him do not respond to them at all. Their case is like that of one who stretches forth his hands towards water, that it may reach his mouth, but it reaches it not. The prayers of those who are unaware of the true God are but a delusion. Chapter 13, verse 15. The second means is to be informed of the perfect beauty of God Almighty, for the heart is naturally drawn to beauty, the observation of which generates love in the heart. God's beauty is his unity and his greatness and his majesty and his other attributes. As the Holy Koran has said, <laughs> Allah 
God is one in his being and his attributes and his glory. He has no partner. All are dependent upon him. He bestows life on every particle. He is the source of grace for everything and is not in need of grace from any. He is neither a son nor a father, for he has no equal and no one is like unto him. Chapter 112, verses 2 to 6. The Koran repeatedly draws attention to God's greatness and grandeur and thus impresses upon the minds of men that only such a God can be the desired objective of the heart and not any dead or weak or pitiless or powerless being. The third means of approach to God is knowledge of his beneficence. For beauty and beneficence are the two incentives of love. The beneficent attributes of God are summed up in Surah Fatiha as follows. That is to say, God creates his servants from nothing out of perfect beneficence and his providence is available to them all the time. <laughs> 